Our ancestors saw the world end once. That whole life was gone. Now we're on the other side of the apocalypse. The different wrongs that have been done to native peoples are just so sickening. I mean, they even had slogans like, kill the Indian, save the man. That's genocide. Millions of people all across the Americas systematically wiped out, starting here on the East Coast. That's the reason that we don't have that relationship with some of those traditional foods anymore. What's popping? I see onions. Yeah, we have uh, red onions, yellow onions, matcha, lower squash. You ready? We're salmon people. Like, what do we do if our salmon don't come back? What I've come to understand is if we want to maintain our culture, then we have to have buffalo as a vital part of our communities. What we're doing is reintroducing our young people to the land, the food, and our traditional ways of healing. Working at the farm has brought a lot of healing to my life. I've been clean 16 years, June now. I learned to heal through harvesting our traditional food. We're celebrating Apache Foodways in a kitchen that was built by Apaches for Apaches. It's this movement among all indigenous people that they're finally, they're listening. And it's like music. When you hear the drum, it's calling you. And it's Mother Earth. And Mother Earth's heart's beating. And she's talking to all of us that we need to do something. Let's inside first, I think. Before there was corn, there was beach is this guy making a giant Fibonacci curve. I started drawing in the sand in 1994. I made one fish about 15 feet long. I thought to myself, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. What he was doing in the art world is mind-blowing. I think the sand paintings are astonishing. Part of the genius of Jim is just that original idea that he had. We cook dinner, we're gonna do it in the field, people are gonna come. This wasn't farm to table, this was table at the farm. That's the best. Pair up some of the best chefs, and then the farmers who actually grow the product. It's such a fun experience. It makes people feel part of something larger than themselves and yet something very human and intimate. A round of applause for Joan, outstanding in the field's favorite farmer. This is about giving people unique experiences that matter. That's what these events do. As he does more and more of it, I see that he's just amazingly good. That's a very gracious gesture for an artist to make to participate in the world that way, to make something that, in a sense, is not about ego. It's really about the thing in and of itself. It's FHC agadi palira kuti e ni climate change chifwa cha ukhalilo wakanyithu wakuwalo nge wa America badango lithu bati kukhumba kuti vhindu visinthi tikumuyendera munthu kuchikaya kwake nakugadumbisikana naye kagomezi gayayi 
Ngala nge nkuroza. God said, you can increase like sand. But he never <laughs> said, spoil the atmosphere. I don't see it as an issue. That's my problem. How are you seeing the climate affecting your family? We see it more as a political agenda. It would take a global catastrophe to do a complete 180. <laughs> It used to be cost of water, cost of land, but right now our biggest challenge is labor. It takes a lot of people. Crops were in take a lot of people. Every year we're seeing less and less people showing up from Mexico. Toda esta fruta está haciendo falta en el mercado, pero no hay quien la pisque. It's gotten really severe recently. We have fields that were beautifully grown and we just couldn't get them picked. Estamos recortando los acres que estamos plantando. Necesitamos que haya gente. If you don't allow for a new supply of labor, the fruit is not going to get picked. I don't want to downsize. I would like to grow. If you don't have the farms, what are you going to have? There'll be a lot of people that lose out if it can't be a more thoughtful debate. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming out on a chilly day. For those of you don't know, who don't know, my name is Danny Nirenberg. I am president and co-founder with Bernie Pollock of Food Tank. We're a research and advocacy organization that really works to try to build a better food system with partners. And that's why I'm so excited to be here. It is my sincere pleasure and honor to welcome you all to the Just Food Community, Culture, and Economy Summit in partnership with Houston Tillotson University, Oatly, Little Herds, and of course, South by Southwest. <laughs> Today, we have a really extraordinary opportunity to listen to some of the foremost experts in culture and cuisine, agriculture and entrepreneurship, and labor and workers' rights, and learn how systemic racism, inequality, uh, and, and other issues have really shaped our current food system, and what can be done to ensure justice, inclusion, and diversity moving forward. Food Tank is extremely honored and humbled to collaborate with Houston Tillotson University. I know that you all call it the gem of the city, and it really is, bringing together a diverse student body with professors and administrators who are focused on tackling big and uncomfortable questions. And then also coming up with really unique and concrete solutions, and that's why we're here today. Houston Tillotson is uh, also the only historically black college and university in Austin, and it's the city's oldest academic institution. This is a place of learning where they understand responsibility, their responsibility and the importance of hosting these kinds of events and conversations. Discussions that make you think, question, and even change your mind. And I hope all of those things happen for you all in the audience today. I also am thrilled to welcome our global audience joining us via live stream. For all of you who are here uh, and, and also watching via the live stream, please feel free to interact with today's sessions uh, on social media. Please use the hashtag uh, FutureFoodSouthbySouthwest so we can amplify your ideas and share your questions. 
I also want to acknowledge two amazing local organizations who really helped us make today happen. Little Herds, who you heard about before, and the Cook's Nook. The Cook's Nook is amazing. Joy Chevalier is my heroine. And I love Robert Nathan Allen. He has just been such a great partner. Yes, let's give them a round of applause. It's so wonderful to be here in Austin where so much is going on in the food and agriculture movement. And I applaud all of you again for coming out on this really cold day and, and being with us. Um, it is now my sincere honor to introduce the president and CEO of Houston Tillotson University, Dr. Colette Pierce Burnett. She is the first female president of the university. Let's give that a round of applause. About time. And she is working to create more equity and equality in education. She is an active member of the Austin community, including participating in the Greater Austin Area Black Chamber, the Austin Community Foundation, the Urban Roots Advisory Council, and the Waterloo Greenway Board. And she co-chairs the Mayor's Task Force on Institutional Racism and Systemic Inequities. She is also this year's recipient of two prestigious awards, with the Austin Chamber of Commerce 2022 Austinite of the Year and the inaugural Barbara Jordan Public Service Award recipient, which is so cool to me, from the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs. So congratulations to her. I also want to thank uh, President Pierce Burnett and Dr. Karen Magid, the Special Assistant to the President and the Director of Sustainability in STEM here, both for their willingness to organize the summit during South by Southwest, and again, to really take on these important issues head on. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Pierce Burnett to the stage. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm so tall. This is very nice. I'm tall like my beautiful sister in the audience. Um, it's really an honor and a pleasure for me to welcome you to Houston Tillerson University. And I want to repeat, uh, which is a part of my stomp speech, that not only are we Central Texas's only historically black college, but we're very proud to be the oldest institution of higher learning. We are older than our sister institution, the University of Texas at Austin. That speaks volumes um, for our campus. And I want to also repeat that I want to personally thank Dr. Karen Maggot, who serves two roles at the institution. She's a specialist, my special assistant, and she's also the director of STEM and sustainability. And it's under, um, uh, it's with Karen, Dr. Maggot's influence that my awareness has been personally heightened about the issues that we'll be discussing today. And it's super fitting for you to have it here on Houston Tillerson campus for many reasons. We consider ourselves to be a sacred space and a safe space and most of all a brave space. So these topics are, require courageous conversations and for us all to, to gather the will to truly address the challenges that we have in our nation and in the particular topic today when it comes to access and equity. So I'm very proud that the university is serving as the host of this today in partnership with Food Tank. And in the Nourishing America tour, it's been brought to my attention across all 50 states that there has been an intentional uh, movement to partner with institutions such as Houston Tillerson University instead of going with the other traditional, more well-known partners. And there's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And this is one of those opportunities where an organization like Food Tank lifts the brand of another institution, which is a true movement towards access and equity. So in that light, I thank you for hosting it here at Houston Tillerson University. And I'd like to think, take a moment to thank a friend of ours, a friend of mine, and that's Joy Chevalier. Joy has been a supporter of, that's right, give Joy a clap it up. Um, she has been a, a, a friend of mine and of the institutions and keeping our awareness heightened in these very important topics, and I just wanted to use this platform, this moment, to thank Joy for that publicly. So the, my final thought is how good it is, my students call it reunited and it feels so good, um, because um, it was this week in 2020 that I knew that the pandemic was real because South by Southwest was canceled. <laughs> and um, that was, a, that was a, a moment. To be, to be reckoned with. 
and we've all been um, harnessed by civic unrest, um, tremendous challenges, and now's the time for us as ordinary citizens to make change and transformation for real, for real this time, and not pretend and be lulled back to sleep after this moment. So that it's not a moment, it is in fact a movement. So on behalf of Austin, I thank you to Austin South by Southwest 2022, and I welcome you to Houston Tillerson University. Thank you. Buju, and Sky Hau, Potawatomi, Ottawa, and Dow. My name is Sky Hau of the Potawatomi and Ottawa Tribal Nations. It is an honor to be in community with each of you here today. We share a land acknowledgement to honor all those who came before us, the original stewards of this land and region, and to acknowledge the truth of our shared history. I invite you to connect with whatever is holding you in this moment, connecting you to the earth below you. If it feels comfortable to you, close your eyes or find a place to rest your gaze. I invite you to take in a deep breath of peace and compassion for yourself and for all those who you are in community with today. As you exhale, I invite you to have reverence for your ancestors and all those who came before you, for all those who built this foundation at Houston Tillotson University, for all those who worked so hard to put together this event today and bring us all together and hold reverence for the generations to come. We honor the original stewards of this land and region, the cattle, the Carrizo, the Comocrudo, the Comanche, the Chickasaw. We honor one of the oldest known tribes to this land and region, the Coatecan, the Delaware, the Huichal, the Mescalero Apache, the Eastern Pueblo, the Karankawa, the Tonkawa. We honor the federally recognized tribes of Texas, the Alabama Cushata tribe of Texas, the Kickapoo traditional tribe of Texas, and the Isleta del Ser Pueblo. We honor the state recognized tribes, the Lapan Apache tribe of Texas, and the Yaqui Band of Texas Indians. We honor all those who have been detribalized. We honor all those who were formerly enslaved. We honor all those who are murdered, who are missing still yet today. We honor all those who are persecuted due to migrating across man-made borderlands. In spite of all that has been done to eradicate our people, we are still here. We are resilient, and we will continue to fight against all the many oppressions that face us. We are in solidarity with all those who face oppression due to their sexual orientation, due to their gender, due to the languages spoken, due to their ethnicity, due to their ability level, due to their age, their religion, all those who encounter oppression due to anti-blackness that shows up daily because the color of their skin has been weaponized. We know that black lives matter and we know that all lives cannot matter until black lives matter. I invite you to take a deep breath in collectively and hold space for the good time that you will make today in community. 
I invite you to go beyond the land acknowledgement and to truly form authentic relationships with the local Native community and to acknowledge Indigenous wisdom that lies within the food justice practices you are trying to attain. Megwetch. Thank you so much. I want to thank Dr. Pierce Burnett and Sky for inspiring us all. It is now my pleasure to welcome Tony Tipton Martin to the stage. I could spend hours introducing her, but let me try to do this succinctly. Tony is a culinary journalist, an award-winning author, and a community activist. Her books celebrate the professional skills and kitchen wisdom of invisible black cooks as culinary role models from whom everyone can learn. She is a recipient of two James Beard Award, Book Awards, the Julia Child Award, and many other distinctions. Her most recent book, entitled Jubilee, is a compilation of 125 recipes adapted from historical texts and rare African-American cookbooks. Her previous book, The Jemima Cove, presents more than 150 cookbooks that range from a rare 1827 house servant's manual to modern class classics. Both of these books highlight the stories of mostly women role models throughout African American history and their contributions to cuisine, food activism, archaeology, restaurant design, and journalism. Tony, please, I, I couldn't be happier to have you here. Please come to the stage. So I've been fangirling Tony for a long time, and I had the opportunity to um, have dinner with her last summer uh, when we were all vaccinated, and it was one of the highlights of my life. It's, I'm kind of going to tear up, because it really was. Meeting you was really a highlight. So I want to thank you for being here. Well, thank you for inviting me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can thank you for inviting me. It's really exciting for me to be back in this building after a number of years leaving Austin. Um, and this was actually one of the last places I was before I left. So thank you so much for this invitation to be back. Oh, we're thrilled to have you here. Yes, let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> so Tony, I mentioned in your intro that you wrote this really, really important book uh, entitled The Jemima Code. And it explores myths about black and American uh, cooks and makers and, and food artisans. And I'm wondering if you can talk about the myths that it helps dispel. Because from my personal experience, I know that white folks have a lot of misconceptions about the origins of food in the United States. And so what are, what are some of those myths, those misconceptions that you're trying to dispel? Sure. Um, so I, if I could just say one really quick thing. Yeah. I, um, I started this work um, because of the myths um, that persisted in, in uh, the larger society about uh, who African American women had been in, the, in history. I couldn't find any examples of women from my community that were knowledgeable, competent, professional. Um, and I layer onto that this, uh, the complication of being a mom raising sure. children in Northwest Austin, in the suburbs, where they were the only black kids in the school. And as we all know, at the beginning of the school year, uh, you start with American history. Right. What does that mean? You start talking about colo colonizing America and Native Americans and African Americans in the slave trade. And it felt so, um, it was such a downer, yeah. you know, for me to be talking about history and trying to find examples for my kids so that when they went back to class and they heard about people that were enslaved, they weren't, I didn't want them to just believe or know or think that the only contribution we made was physical labor. Right. And that was the only perception um, that, that we had. So the, the whole project, you know, between the pursuit of a story about my grandmother and the women in my community um, and who they actually were, um, aligned with my desire for my children to have a broader understanding of who their ancestors had been. Right. Um, so with that, I will say that the mythology that exists around African Americans has largely beyond this labor myth, mm -hmm. the, the truth. Actually, that yeah. is true. We were the laborers. But what is compatible with that story is the fact that we were competent and proficient laborers. We, we were not people who were just mindlessly taking instructions and um, you know,
know, stirring pots and pulling weeds, right, and yeah. clipping cotton. There were people that had proficiencies. Today, that information can seem a little, um, I don't know, like, m like old news because mm -hmm. people are talking about that more and more. Sure. But if we remember that when I started this work 20 right. years ago, there was nobody nothing. was talking about this. And it's so important that you're highlighting all these role models so that BIPOC folks know who their ancestors are, that they can look up to them. For sure, for sure. Yeah, and I think it's so important that this book is being distributed, am I right, here at Houston Tillotson to some of the students? I hope so, that okay. was my request. Um, because one of the things I notice when I speak all around the country is um, the books are not cheap. Right. Um, and it appears that students would like to have this information, but sometimes the, uh, the financial barrier is too steep. Right. And so I'm really grateful to your organization for being willing to partner with me to make sure that students get a copy. No, of no and it book. is such a wonderful book, and I learned so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I was, I was at a university in Southern California a couple years ago before COVID, and I, um, there was a student that was clearly waiting around until the end. He just really wanted the book. And I asked the organizers if they would, you know, like, comp, kind of yeah. like a comp book, and they wouldn't. So I had to go out to the signing table with my credit card to buy the book for this student. So yeah, it it's really means a lot to me that this material get into the hands of the next generation. Absolutely, absolutely. We all need role models that look like us to look up to, and I think that's what you've provided, and this work has been so important. You're right, it just didn't happen yesterday. You've been working on it for two decades. That is true, and the, the, the organization of the Jemima Code as a book, um, it certainly is, as you described, a uh, bibliography of my rare book collection, but it also places those books in social context, right. which is really, really important. I wanted uh, people to understand that these books did not just exist on shelves, right? That people uh, struggled within a system to become published. Right. And then once they were published and once I had them all in front of me, what I discovered was the incredible competencies that were revealed by these books. And so what you can see is that uh, the books organized themselves through decades around careers. And so was able to point out to the future uh, at whatever age we are, even right. those of us that are um, you know, coming into the industry as a second career, sure. as, I meant, as one woman mentioned to me earlier, um, what people are able to see is that African Americans were performing at high level in different ways throughout the food industry, not just in, in service to others. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that competency is part of this is so important that what we're seeing in American food today was built literally on the backs of black folks. Yes, for sure. Um, and um, in one of the triggers, uh, there's been so many triggers for me over the years, but we were, um, we took our kids and we were in um, outside of New Orleans on the um, Plantation River Road. And there was a plantation that had not yet been um, excavated and turned mm. into a historic site. So it was still open for like the public could just like touch stuff. You know, there was no velvet rope or sure. anything like that. And one of the things that the um, docents was showing us was the difference between what happened um, in the building when the black people were doing the work and when they weren't. And so there was this wall, for example, where the brickwork and the mortar was very precise and um, very strong and sturdy. And then sh this person identified for us, this is the part of the wall where the owners had to make the, make the mending, had to mend the wall after people were wow. set free. Okay, I understand that that means they didn't have the competencies, and I don't want to, you know, get tripped up over whether they were, you know, living a life of leisure and all of that. Sure. The point that I fixate on is the fact that the African Americans had that skill set. Right. So if they, if we level the playing field for everybody and just say, and nobody had any of those skills then we can level up and see just how much competency this mason had in their ability to put that wall together. Absolutely, absolutely. That's a really powerful story. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, so I was looking for those kinds of stories in the food world uh, because the food world is my space. Right, right. I, right. I'm, not in, I'm not a... Um, masonry yeah, I'm <laughs> person. Not mason, I'm not in masonry. <laughs> no, that's great. I want to turn to Jubilee and, and talk to you a little bit about how Jubilee builds on the Jemima Code. 
Um, so as I have uh, been quoted uh, saying often, uh, when I try to sell this material to New York publishers, to academics, um, no one was interested in talking about this content. Um, uh, maybe because there was no evidence of what I, w what I theorized. I had this idea that my grandmother and her contemporaries were smarter than we had been told, but I had no evidence of that. Sure. And so until I got the books, I didn't know uh, just how much knowledge they contained. Um, but they contained so much information that once I was able to publish with UT Press, um, we realized there was just too much to put in one book. Mm -hmm. It was already going to be such a challenge to the established narrative uh, about African Americans in the food is industry sure. that we thought the best thing to do was initially just introduce the fact that they even existed to prove they were here. Um, I had always wanted this to be a beautiful coffee table book. I did not want it to be a collection of scholarly uh, essays and sure. footnoted you know, documentation, not because I don't think that that's valuable, but because I knew that there was also an image that we had to overcome, and that was the image of the plantation mammy. So I always wanted this to be a spectacularly beautiful book. And so when UT Press came to me with the idea of publishing the book, their conditions were two things. Uh, one, that I not change the title. They were very excited. I don't know if my editor's here, but um, that I not change the title and that it be a beautiful coffee table book. And I was just like, oh my God, this is such a blessing. That's so great. Um, um, so we knew that the next book would have to be um, uh, the recipes. Mm -hmm. And now what I'm working on is the third part of this project, which is single subject books. Mm. So that we can keep taking a deeper dive into who these people were as time goes on with each book. So the first book in the series is Jubilee Cocktails. I love it. I love that you're this culinary detective really <laughs> seeking out all of these. That's these a good word. Yeah, like yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's use that. Put it in your bio. Because you, are, you have to dig very deep into these historical texts. You do, and that's part of what I have hoped that the next generation takes away from this work. Um, it's so easy to see now the success that I've achieved, um, and I'm very, very proud of sure. the accomplishments. Um, but with social media and the internet, it can make it all look so easy. Right. And we really need to be aware that there is a rigor and a discipline and um, a lot of cross-referencing uh -huh. and uh, focus that it took in order to get this material to the place where it is. Can we talk more about that discipline? Because there are students here today who are trying to figure out what they want to do with their lives. Of and that discipline is so important, I think. And whatever they choose to do, whether it's being a culinary detective or you know, b uh, being a culinary journalist or whatever career they choose in food or, or agriculture. Yeah, so uh, there's just so many points I could make on that topic. Um, one is certainly that I had, I don't want people to get lost in this fact that I've been in the industry for over 40 years. Because oh, that possible. does not mean that I had an automatic entree and a privilege to be able to get this published. As I said, I was unable to get this material published. The industry thought that a scholar would be better equipped to deliver this content. Um, so the first part of that, I guess the first part of uh, my formula was that I had to become as educated as I possibly right. could to stand in the face of that type of scholarship. So what I did as a journalist was, um, for a while I thought I was gonna just go get a PhD, honestly. Sure, sure. That's the way I thought I was gonna earn my respect in the industry. Um, and the longer that I did the work, more people said to me, Journal, don't you remember journalists get public get Pulitzer Prizes? You don't have to have a PhD. Um, so I came down to here and I got a uh, borrower's card, a courtesy borrower's card at UT, at Perry Castaneda Library. So the first step I would say is to self-advocate. Get your own information first. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could read a lot of scholarship. I came down here every day when my kids were at school and I took one um, index at a time. So I would read all the Southern work, then I would read all of the women's studies, then I would read all of the you know, uh, American history. Like I just went through each category. It took me a couple of years and I became self-educated about American history. Mm -hmm. um, and no matter where I looked, I did not find the content I was looking for. 
that refer to African American his African Americans and food. I mean, unless like I said, I saw a few things. Sure, right? and sure. So I've gotten a massive bibliography of all of the content that I've read over the years. Um, but what I did stumble on was a bibliography of cookbooks at the University of Alabama. Uh -huh. So persistence is also important yeah. here. Um, I, I once I discovered the University of Alabama bibliography, I started to find some sense of um, my own identity within a system, right? And so the first part was that I just had this idea and lots of students, you know, young people, people that are new to, a, to an industry have an idea. Um, the question is how do you monetize it? How do sure. you validate it? And the way that I did that was to first become educated mm -hmm. and then to actually um, gather my resources. Um, which meant finding allies, partners, support, mentors, somebody that knew more than I did. Yeah. Even if they didn't know more about the subject, right. they knew more about the industry. Um, and so I have a long list of those uh, kinds of things, but that developing of um, rigor and um, really just knowing your facts. I think one of the mistakes that's happening now is because social media has made ac information so easily accessible. Sure. We're not always sure who these sources are. Right. And in some ways it's an echo chamber and we're just repeating the same material that someone else said. And um, I think in a lane like advocacy and particularly in African American studies and history, where we're trying to carve out new identities, we want to be really careful. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to leave room for criticism. Like, I'm not saying you have to be perfect. I, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is um, stand in your authority. Yeah. Right? And the only way you can do that is to be, to know what you know that right. you know, right? And not try to be something that you're not. That was also really important. I had to come to grips with the fact that I was a journalist. Journalists do great investigative work. Um, so becoming confident in your own space, in yeah. your own skin is also really important. That's really important advice. And that also that validation and the persistence to keep moving forward, even when you don't have the answers and they seem very, very far away, years away even. Uh, yeah, they, and for me, they were years away. It's hard to imagine you 20 years ago, like doing this as, you know, going through libraries, you know, before these things were very accessible and, and really, you know, making this incredible collection. Yeah, I never intended to be a collector, but once I came here and uh, discovered that I could not actually see the, the books firsthand, uh, which is important to journalists, we need to be able to be observers in our own right, and I needed first person, uh, and uh, I needed first person um, evidence, and so the only solution I had left was to purchase the books. Wow. Um, and so I was a stay-at-home mom which means that I didn't, re I had family resources, but I did not have an income of my sure. own. And the idea of telling my husband that I was going to be paying a couple hundred dollars for a book that was disintegrating, you know, right before my very eyes because it was a hundred years old, mm, that didn't really <laughs> appeal to me. He I'm didn't like, like well, it? How am I gonna <laughs> tell this man? He says, what did you buy? And I'm going like this pile of shredded paper that's, you know, moldy. Um, but um, what I did was to support myself um, was I sold freelance articles for a women's magazine called Heart and Soul. And I wrote about food and nutrition uh, for African American women. Um, and that was something I could do within this time that I had available yeah. while my kids were at school um, to raise just enough money to buy a book every time one popped up on eBay that I was able to buy. And the first one that I bought was um, $400, oh my gosh. Um, and I was new to eBay, but my neighbor was really competent in it. <laughs> and so she came down and she set the clocks. Um, we, we were like, we're gonna time our clocks for, you, this is a long time ago, you guys don't, nobody even uses eBay anymore. But it was new then, and it was definitely new to me. And she said, you're gonna set your time clock and you're not going to identify that you're interested in it. Just keep stalking and watching <laughs> this book. Wow. But don't tell it. She had this whole system set it's up. It's amazing. It was pretty funny. And she said, don't tell it. Don't let them know that you're interested. So we just kept refreshing the page and watching the price go up. So it started as a dollar. And the reason that I wanted this particular book was back to my point about finding your own lane and your own identity and becoming confident in it. 
once I realized that there was a book published in 1936 in Los Angeles by a group called the um, Negro Culinary Arts Club of Los Angeles, um, that set off bells and whistles for me because it made the point just in the title of their group right. that they were disputing the mythology of the plantation mammy right there in their cookbook. And so I almost would have paid anything <laughs> you know, that I could afford for that book. Um, anyway, so quickly I did this, um, got through to the very last minute where they, you know, you finally put in your bid and it was like up to 300 and something dollars. <laughs> and so I entered $400 and I closed my eyes, you know, push send. Sure. And it came back and said, you won. <sighs> and I was so excited. And later I was invited to speak at the University of Michigan about the very first black book that we know of um, to be published in 1866 by a free wow. woman of color. And I put the slide up of that picture, of that book. And from the back of the room, the librarian archivist at the University of Michigan screamed out and said, that was you? <laughs> <laughs> and so to this day, they are advocating to be the place where my book archive goes because I, owe, I somehow owe it to them that I took a book from, from the students. So I keep trying to give back to students everywhere. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you. I think one of the things I like about your work the most is that you do keep identifying these alternative pathways to success. Mm -hmm. It's not just about being a journalist or an advocate. It's about finding all of these other routes to being standing in your own place, standing in your own skin. I'm wondering if you can dig a little bit more into that and why that's important and how you've learned to do that throughout the years. It's, it's difficult. I'm still learning. You're still oh, learning, I'm so sure. Oh, it's so difficult. And the, and the social narratives that we have all been brought up under, like we were talking about right. just backstage, the this tendency that some of us have to apologize all the time. Me. Oh, I'm, so, <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, like, point out that you stepped on my foot. Like, <laughs> like those are just the things that we do um, subconsciously. And so there's all of this that's circulating and swirling around us. Um, but I... Uh, wanted to make sure that, as I said, students, young people particularly, would understand that there were so many other pathways in this industry. And the one that's fresh of, freshest of mine to me today is the, is the bartender story and mixologist because I'm working on a cocktail book. And I am not a bartender, I am not, that's not my area of expertise, but I have become educated about that. Um, and it's a, what I've discovered is that there was a time, a point in time, where um, African Americans were, um, well, let me start over. The African American book collection has cocktail recipes in it up through prohibition. Then they end and they disappear from the pages of the book and they don't start again until after the soul food era in the 70s. So the first trigger, the first question for me as an investigator is what's going on here? Right. Why do these recipes disappear? Why aren't they being handed down? So I start with a question. Mm -hmm. What I've discovered is that the social narrative that I think drove that is that people, African Americans were being portrayed as derelict, lazy, public drunk, sure. uh, wasting their money in juke joints. I stumbled on a photograph, a series of photographs um, that have captions that say things like, you know, the, the sharecroppers wasting all their money um, in juke joints. And so I am now not trying to put a Pollyannish spin on that story. What I'm looking for is what do the black people say? Right. about this. What was their experience here? And we all have that ability to step outside of ourselves and ask about someone else's experience. Absolutely. We can ask, what can I do? Uh, what can I, uh, how can I, where can I be, make a difference? Sure. Um, and in my case, it is to look at these stories throughout that have run up here throughout history and look for the counter narrative. What are, what are the African Americans doing? They're not doing anything different than anybody else in this situation. They've worked all week. We all go out, can't wait to run to happy hour, <laughs> right? Like there's all these things that we do that the rest of society does, and yet the portrayal is somehow negative. Absolutely. And so that's gonna be what spins this book, is this um, giving a new legacy 
to African Americans in the bartending profession oh. and, and what that really means. There's been a lot of work already on black mixology, sure. which is really, uh, like people don't even think those two things no. like go together. Um, but there's an entire group of men who in the eight, end of the um, 19th century were, they had a group called the Colored Mixologist Club. I love it. Yeah, so there's, there's lots of uh, counter narratives that we can tell. And that's why we're here today to explore those counter narratives and make sure that we hear truths Right. that those come out. I could talk to you for hours, as you know. We have sadly run out of time. Let's give Tony Tipton Martin a round of applause, please. Thank you so much Thank for you. having me. Thank you. Please. <laughs> Standing ovation would be great. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank Tony again. Uh, she has a very busy travel schedule, so I'm glad she could make it here and, uh, and, and share that knowledge with all of you. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to one of my very favorite food and agriculture journalists, Tom Philpot from Mother Jones. He'll be uh, moderating our next discussion on agriculture and entrepreneurship. So please join me in welcoming Tom, Rihanna Lynn from Journey Foods, Joy Chevalier from The Cook's Nook, and Sue Beckwith from the Texas Center for Local Food to the stage. Welcome everyone, and thank you to Food Tank and the sponsors uh, for inviting us. Um, I could not be more excited about this panel. Um, and I think that we, um, we live in a time when, when you think about entre entrepreneurs and that kind of whole idea, it's really easy or even hard not to now think about Elon Musk you know, building a, a space rocket to, so we can escape climate change and move to Mars or you know, some Stanford grad um, you know, innovating an app that, um, that basically drains money from independent restaurants and screws workers at the same time so we can get, you know, order food and get it delivered in five minutes. But there are other visions of, of this concept that involve communities coming together in solidarity and solving actual problems and building economies, innovating to build economies that actually work for people in those communities. And I think that it's a lot more complex and difficult um, without having a social democracy. And you know, we're here in a state um, where healthcare is not only not universal, but we're one of the few states that didn't expand Medicaid. Um, and has um, you know, tremendous hurdles to get healthcare if you're a low-income person. And of course, that puts the burden on, um, on small businesses. This is a country where you know, your employer is supposed to provide your healthcare. Um, and that just makes it much more difficult. Um, you know, things like the low minimum wage, um, all these things make it very difficult to do a kind of just version of entrepreneurship in this country um, but what we have here is some people trying to figure out a way um, to do it that isn't extractive, that, um, that doesn't screw workers, that includes farmers, that includes people um, who are disadvantaged, that recognizes the racial inequality that we have in this country and the income inequality, and tries to build models from the ground that address that. So, um, so with that, I, um, you know, I'm just, the, you know, these are some very inspiring people here, um, and I want to introduce them one by one. We've got Rihanna Lynn um, from Journey Foods here. Um, welcome to sort of semi-post-pandemic Austin. You've been here for a couple of years, and now we're finally um, seeing it lift. Um, who needs no introduction in this room? Um, Joy Chevalier, um, who does his, uh, lots and lots of amazing work. Um, and, um, and finally, we've got um, Susan Beckwith with the Texas Center for Local Food, um, which is moving to build a, um, a sort of, you know, to remember that one of the things that we have to do when we talk about local business is include farmers and figure out a way to um, bring farmers into the discussion. So, why, you know, with that introduction, why don't we start with you, Sue, and sort of move this way. Um, Take a few minutes to tell us what you're up to and you know, sort of the challenges and opportunities you see out there right now. 
Okay, thank you so much. It's really wonderful to be here with all of you. I was telling Joy that I haven't sat this close to someone I wasn't married to in two years. <laughs> so it's a pleasure, honey. <laughs> so the t I can't see you, so uh, let me know. Uh, the Texas Center for Local Food supports, provides education and technical assistance for farmers and ranchers across Texas to help make sure that they can have a viable business, a viable farm business. That, of course, means that people have to buy their food, right? And they have to be able to get it to the person that's buying it. Um, Dr. Pierce Burnett talked about keeping it real. So I want to just give you just a little bit of reality about Texas. There's 30 million people here. We spend probably about $150 billion a year on food. And all of the organic and sustainable farmers in our state, there's probably fewer than 200. And if we're talking about black farmers and ranchers, there's probably a couple dozen who are selling human food to people. I mean, what do we think would happen after four years of theft, deprivation? I mean, calling it discrimination is, is, is doing it a favor. So the skills are gone, the, the tools are rusted, and a lot of the land is lost. So that's kind of where we are, and that's kind of what's real in Texas. The Rio Grande Valley, beautiful, grows most of the food that's grown in Texas, and is home to the most impoverished counties in our state, and some of the most impoverished counties in the country. Is that okay with you? No. Black farmers and ranchers are losing heritage land in central Texas every single day to predatory developers. Letters and phone calls every single day. Is that okay with any of us? No. So who's doing that? And who do we know who's doing that and we can make them stop doing that? So that's really my introduction. Uh, I just, I wanna. <laughs> I want to inspire you to work within your sphere of influence to center the farmer in the food you eat, in, the, in, the, in your business, in your school, in your philanthropy. What are you doing to support farmers and ranchers in Texas, in your region? Because whatever benefits the farmer is going to benefit you, is going to benefit all of us. So use your entrepreneurial spirit, use your creativity. And, and follow that farmer and follow that money and ask questions. Who's the farmer who benefits? Where are they? What is the benefit to them? And when are they gonna benefit, right? And farm workers are farmers, by the way. So, thank you. All right. <laughs> okay, that was Sue. <laughs> <laughs> and she always speaks the truth. Um, I am Joy Chevalier and I own the Cook's Nook here in Austin. <laughs> and um, I am, I'm, I'm really fortunate. I was one of those who had the ability to leave a corporate role as a global strategist and say, what's missing in Austin and where am I going to go next? What am I going to do? And what skills do I have and where should that be? And there's this thing that we now call food and tech. And it was, how do we bring together the processes that we know how to do in technology, which is to get to market, create products, uh, create sustainable businesses, and where should I take that and end up in, in culinary? Um, and it's been an amazing ride here in, in Austin at the Cook's Nook. Um, and then most, we'll talk about some of that, some more of that later. Um, but then uh, a couple years ago, uh, while in a COVID fever, um, I, as a product person, um, decided that it was uh, essential to figure out a new method to feed lots of people um, using what was happening in a, a broken supply chain and a broken labor market. Um, and we came up with the idea that many of you know is now Keep Austin Together or CFAN. Uh, which is the program that feeds about 12,000 uh, across Travis County with uh, prepared meals, nutritious prepared meals, um, and a distribution model uh, that was unique and targeted, which had been my career at Dell, was to actually run all of targeting worldwide for them. Um, and how do we reach those communities? Um, and so that's what we created, and that's what, that's what I still do these days, along with trying to figure out how do we create uh, just Systems as part of the uh, Austin-Travis County Food Policy Board. So yeah, that's a short story. 
Wonderful. Nice. Well, I'm, I'm Rihanna Lin. I'm the founder of Journey Foods, and I'm just grateful to be here. That's, that's my introduction. But no, um, Sue, Joy, Tom, uh, Danny, Tony, I mean, what such great inspiration I can draw from and, and sort of push forward as I, my, I consider myself a, a technologist, a tech, uh, a scientist turned technologist. Um, I come from a family of farmers that migrated uh, from Alabama up north to Chicagoland area in the 60s. And um, so you know what's interesting, you said that. I received a call literally about two hours ago. Um, someone calling from my grandmother. We, we co-owned some land together um, to see if we wanted to sell some land in South Carolina. Hmm. And um, they usually contact her, but I don't know how they got my number. And so what's, what's so interesting um, is that I sort of have this history of agriculture in my family and really started out in food, supporting local farmers in Chicago um, with a chain of juice bars and then launched a uh, food traceability company um, before working in um, more tech and, and, and venture capital. Uh, when I landed on really the goal around Journey Foods and that is in the packaged food industry. Um, at Journey Foods, we focus on the $3 trillion problem that's really accelerated every decade since the 1940s. Um, when in the 1940s, we were sort of smallholder farmers, family sustenance, we were all pretty much farmers in our families, all of us here. Um, and even if, even if your family immigrated here and you know, today, 70% of our daily caloric intake is packaged processed foods. Um, you could say, and I often say that packaged processed foods are, is probably the number one cause for death worldwide. Um, chronic disease is, is really critically linked to um, the way we eat. And um, at Journey Foods, we really focus on the what and how of, of the packaged foods that, that we are consuming every single day. And so um, our team, is driving critical data services around sustainability and nutrition. And what's most important now is the supply chain and cost. Yeah. Lots of companies are greenwashing and trying to bring better products to the market, but at the end of the day, if it's not affordable for their bottom line or for the consumers, we just can't get it done. And um, I continue to be grounded in these moments and very grateful uh, for Danny inviting me here so that we can and so that I can leave a tech bubble and make sure that we're continually working and partnering to figure out how we can best address uh, the most critical uh, problems that we're facing through the food supply chain, especially in, in packaged foods. And um, additionally, at Journey Foods, last year we launched Journey Labs. We we're working with 15 universities across the world and six HBCUs to make sure, especially, uh, that black students uh, are building the future of data in food and uh, HT uh, sort of uh, student sourcing is a part of that. And um, yes, I wanna continue the conversation around on data and tech, um, but I hope I can sort of lean on the shoulders of you all and, and make sure we continue to like sort of focus on exchange. It's a great combination of people up here. Yeah. Well, I was just gonna say, one of the models that we sort of use in talking about food and tech is this notion that there's these market sets. And one is production, one is transformation, and then you have market and retail. Right, that, that experience when it actually reaches people. And that sort of is kind of what sits here, you know, when we talk about farms produced, what is the value, what's the dollar, how does it, how does it stay there? But one of the challenges that always happens in this transition is it's the transformers where the money goes. It is moved from, from the producer and it sits in these other, these other buckets. And part of, I think, what Sue and I often talk about is how do we turn that into a loop <laughs> versus just going this way, if you think about it? Yeah, and I think that it's a great way to um, transition into my question that I have for you all because um, I think one of the, the, the real, I mean, I feel like you guys are really on the front lines of the, the big problems in the food system. And I've been on it, you know, I've been a restaurant worker, I've been, um, sort of a, a, a small-scale farmer trying to, you know, figure out how to how to make a living, um, and um, and it seems like the, the the big paradoxes here are kind of going back to my introduction about the the inequality in this country, the 
the legacy of racism that remains uh, very much alive and vibrant today. Um, you know, particularly, you know, farming, the history of African American farmers being just this sort of gaping example. Um, that the, the, the challenge is figuring out a way to have a business that um, pays the farmer a fair price. And th this is the, you know, basically what I bang my head up, uh, the wall that I bang my head up against for, for 10 years, the farm, pro um, farm project that I did in um, North Carolina. Um, getting the farmer a fair price, keeping the farm business sustainable while creating a product that is accessible that doesn't just feed an elite who can afford to, to, to pay it. Um, and I'm wondering if y'all could just sort of wrestle with that question and, 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 and think about how, you know, what um, small businesses trying to do that, trying to operate in a just way in this sort of unjust society, what are some of the things that, um, I don't know if it's policies or consumer behavior or business practices, but how have you all wrestled with that? My head I mean, is yeah, with yeah, it. I can jump in there. I mean, for, for me, I really think about the fact that I've had experience in, in all of those corners, right? I started my career as a, uh, as a genetics a researcher, as a biologist, where I was really researching like the history of nutrition, and then I um, got the opportunity to work for our first black president, Obama, in the White House um, in the first and second term before becoming a full-time entrepreneur and one thing that I realized was that um, research was too slow and policy was too slow. But, <laughs> you know, startups, entrepreneurship could drive things a little bit faster. At least I'd like to think that way. But at the end of the day, we need to make sure that all three of those areas are connected. Um, the research and the academic, the, all of the academic institutions that drive the support um, and sort of the scholarly um, results that really can can support policy changes and then the entrepreneurs that are on the ground that can really drive and show like what what's happening whether it's a farmer whether it's someone working in logistics whether it's you know working in data like what we do um, and what we need to really remember is that no one of no one core of those areas is more important than the other um, and we all need each other to sort of push things forward and so um, one thing that I love that Food Tank continually has done and shown up and made consistent is that we have policy discussions at every talk. I mean, I've been in AI talks with Danny and these were on Capitol Hill. Uh, and so I think policy has really kept um, sort of farmer pay, farmer subsidies at an in interesting role right now. I mean, when we think about the history of like sugar, for example, and farmer subsidies, like black farmers were at the core of, uh, in sort of the innovation of sugar production over the past 100, 120 years, and they're essentially, um, you know, less than 1% of the market today. And so I think we need to make sure that our policy makers and, and, and show up and make sure that they're driving as much inclusivity as possible and also biodiversity. Like, we don't have enough conversations about how we can make sure our policies are driving the support and biodiversity of our small farmers. Indeed. So Thanks for bringing it up, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I was just gonna add, you, you talked about policy being too slow, and I think national policy really is, but when you start to talk about local policy um, and what's happening particularly in your city or your region, you know, the hope is that you'll see a bit more, more speed. But I, I, I think on the practical level, one of the things that some of us here locally try to do is, you know, ensure that our purchasing power works both directions, right? You have to mark out some part of that, or be honest, give up some margin mm -hmm. <laughs> in order to be able to, to do that, right? And to look fairly at these lists and say, okay, how do I ensure that in whatever program or the product that I'm making that I can find uh, the, you know, the right product with the right OPEX and engage them directly and say, look, I can make this happen, but it's gonna take both of us. So part two of that is the farmers have to come to market. They can't just sort of produce and stay out there and say, I made the stuff and that's, that's that. They're gonna have to come to market 
and have a market conversation about those products so that the folks who are going to consume and use them, say like we do in our meals or, or any other product or even a CPG product, um, they can actually be a part of the conversation in order to fit their product into others' pricing and models that will work. And be willing to have a conversation. We cannot have a, it's okay to have a math conversation about costs. Don't be ashamed to do that, right? Especially hey, I if you majored in mathematics. I know. I'll do that. I know. And if you want to win, you're going to have to go have the com how does that how much does that cost? Okay, this is what it's going to cost me. Let's find a place to be able to do this. Wait, period. Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. Like, when you say come to market, like what does that mean for you? We have companies all the time that are like, we want to buy from black farmers. We want to buy from local farms here. We want this ingredient at this price. We're looking for more indigenous crops, etc. Oh, you're talking about you're talking yeah. about big corporate. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, okay. Mean, <laughs> these can be companies with, you know, $10,000 in sales that are, you know, starting off their mission like that. So, like, what do you mean by coming to market? Because I feel like there's still so many barriers for these farmers sure. just to sell at a local farmer's market. So, uh, when I say come to market, I mean that you're going to find those transform entrepreneurs who are going to take your product with them to market, right? It's going to be in their food. It's going to be in their process. It's going to be in their distribution in order for those costs to work between the two of you to make that happen, right? Okay. I think it, for that to happen right now, from what I know in Texas, the company needs to find a black farmer or two that almost all are in the starting blocks. Mm -hmm. So that land is fallow and it has muck cows on it because that's the best value for the taxes. Mm -hmm. And then talk with that farmer and figure out what crop that farmer can grow and what crop that company will buy and what they will pay, and then it's worth the farmer taking the risk. But I mean, the price isn't gonna get any lower. So, I mean, it's not. It, it, 30 miles from here, farmland last week sold 20 acres, $80,000 an acre, $2 million. Whoa. So entrepreneurs out there, change makers out there, how about talking to the real estate yeah, industry? We're in the real estate business, Who's guys. Making money <laughs> off of that taking of that farmland. Not that it was growing food before, but if it, it could. So if the real estate industry gave 0.5%, 0.5% of their real estate commissions to a farmland fund, just in the Austin area, it would raise almost $6 million a year. <laughs> so do that. So, so right. would the idea be that you create this, this tax, or whatever you want to call it, um, and you raise this money, and, that, and some entity buys the farmland, matches farms, farmers. There's a program I was just talking to, a, a young woman here today, Farm Share? Yes. Yes. Farm yes. Share there's there's a variety training? of models of how yeah. that money could and be And then used. you match farmers with... Um, you match farmers with community-owned land from this. Um, I mean, that would be a way, I mean, I'm always looking for um, when there's something happening in a, in a community um, that is, seems detrimental, like when you have this massive real estate boom, this, you know, gentrification beyond, I grew up in Austin, I grew up in the north side, northeast side of Austin, and the gentrification that I've seen is beyond, it's beyond Brooklyn, it's beyond, San Francisco, I mean, it is just incredible. Um, but so you've got this massive real estate boom, you've got this gentrification, but okay, what, this is happening, what can we pull out of it? Well, let's make the real estate um, people that are driving around in Mercedes, um, let's take a little bit of the money they're making and start building community institutions from it, is yeah, the idea. Yeah, and I'm not even saying make them. I'm saying, you know, what's fair? What's fair and what's right? If you're making millions of dollars because you're, you're an entrepreneur and you're building a giant factory east of Austin, what's fair? What are your, what are your employees going to eat? It might be fair to Don't, take it. It might be fair to impose yeah, a tax on I said it might be fair to impose a tax on them. <laughs> Expropriate. But I mean, don't don't we all want our children to come to? Don't don't kids learn better when they eat healthy food? Don't workers work better when we're eating healthy food? So we all have a vested interest here, and I think, and this may sound way beyond you know the scope here, but we I think we have to think about what does it mean to be human in our society right now? What does it mean for us to live together in community? 
striving for harmony and healthiness. And, that, and that's why I think it's important when I was, we were talking about coming, coming to market, you're trying to find the win-win here. We, this is not a battle that any individual entrepreneur is gonna win by themselves. You're going to have to have partners. They're partner entrepreneurs. We figured out that's how we, that's how we get ahead. We spend all of our time finding, finding that. But part of that partnership has to be with farmers, but they can't be afraid of us. And there's reason why they're afraid of us, okay? That the technologist who now has this facility who makes, I mean, makes you know, food and meals, I mean, okay, that, that, that will breed anxiety, right? Um, and so that trust is lost, and so we have to spend time saying, I'm gonna show you how you can afford to do this, how we could afford to do this, and we all go to market together successfully. But I have to show, but you have to invest the time and actually have to show them. Okay, we have time, I think, for each person to take 15 seconds. Oh my gosh, I, it's I so fast. I just realized the clock is right in front of me. Yeah. Okay, I don't have a sound bite ready, so you go. <laughs> me? There's a win-win situation here, right? There absolutely is, right? But it is with us individuals knowing what we need, going to those spaces, and actually saying, how do we, one, two, three, four, whatever that is, make that happen and make that visible and we go to market and make money together period end of discussion together not in hyper competition but we try to figure out ways yeah to work there's parties. no need for hyper competition and and hyper competition will not make production win no well there's other folks right but there is a win here at this entrepreneurial level 15 seconds i you know i think 40 years ago, we were spending 20% of our average dollar on food and 8% and on our health, and today it's 24 on our health and 8% and on our food. I think when we, we come here in the title of this event, it's community, culture, and, and ec economy. Um, we need to figure out ways to spend more money, not you know more money in ingredients on, at the grocery store. We, we're trying to figure that out. But spend more of our time, more of our investment, more of our dollars, more of our uh, infrastructure build on the food industry because it's really an, an inextricable, inextricable link to most of our problems that, that are, we're all facing today and I hope that we can sort of have a combined interest in figuring those things out. Yeah. Last word. In 2007, the iPhone was invented and there was never a campaign against the landline. So I think sometimes we think about fighting against but remember, there was never a campaign against the landline. New ways of doing things were brought to the fore. They came into our lives, and the old ways fell into disuse. So we can do this. We can do this if we pay attention, follow the food, follow the money. We can make a change and create the food system that we really want to have. Well, this conversation is only getting started. Unfortunately, we have to bring it to a close. Thank you, you Food amazing. Tank. Thank you, Thank you, you so much. Thank, Thank you, Food Tank. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the shout out. I love you. I've missed you. This pandemic has been. That panel was amazing. Thanks so much to Tom, Rihanna, Sue, and of course, Joy. They are rock stars and some of my favorite people in the world. I, I'm now excited to introduce two people I greatly admire because of their commitment and advocacy around improving labor and workers' rights. First is a person well known to the Austin area, our moderator, Errol Schweitzer. Uh, and then we have the amazing Cortland Harrison, Harrison from the Starbuck. <laughs> yes. Let's go ahead and give him a round of applause. Cortland Harrison. From, this, from the Starbucks Workers United Union. This is going to blow your mind, this conversation. I can't wait. Welcome to the stage, Errol and Cortland. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Hello, Austin. We got a crowd in here. <laughs> you know what? Let's give a hand to Starbucks United. Yeah, let's give a hand to Starbucks United. And let's give a hand to the Memphis Seven over here, my wonderful Woo! colleagues and partners. You'll hear from them tomorrow. They got a wonderful story for you all. So, Cortland, 
why don't you introduce yourself first? Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Cortland Harrison. I am a partner at the Elmwood location Starbucks in Buffalo, New York, and we're the first Starbucks to unionize in the United States. Woo! So, let's go Buffalo! <laughs> Well, you, you brought the weather with you. Yeah, I did. Um, it's about the same temperature as it is here in Buffalo, so <laughs> thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's give a little context to what you folks are doing up there in Buffalo. What were the working conditions that you were experiencing, particularly during COVID-19, that let's say, inspired this campaign? Uh, well, I would say the number one issue that inspired this campaign was definitely pay. I mean, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but inflation is out of control right now. And we were seeing partners who can't afford their rent. We were seeing partners who were struggling with food insecurity. Meanwhile, we're seeing the corporate elite at our, at our job make billions of dollars in profit. I mean, it's ridiculous that they're making so much money and we're out here struggling. Um, and if we're struggling in Buffalo, imagine how workers are doing in cities that have a higher cost of living. I mean, how are they surviving out here in Austin? How are they surviving out there in California? So we just felt the need, we felt like it was the time to fight back against corporate greed. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of corporate greed, yeah. let's talk a bit about the tactics that Starbucks is employing in order to disrupt the campaign and break this union? Um, well, their favorite tactic is to hire a bunch of workers right before a store has an election vote in hopes to sway the vote. I was one of the nine people that they hired right before the vote to try and sway the vote. However, they did no research into me because I'm like, <laughs> Like, day one of my job there, um, on my first day, I signed a union card. So, I mean, I went into this like, yeah, let's unionize. So, <laughs> um, what else did they try to do? They were doing these ridiculous uh, anti uh, union busting meetings where they would like sit us down and try to tell us how big and scary the unions were. Um, they flew in all these uh, CEO, they had the CEO, or I mean, sorry, the president of North America in our stores, a woman I had never met in my life, like trying to tell me why I shouldn't unionize. Meanwhile, she's wearing like an $800 jacket. So it's like, come on, read the room. But yeah, no, uh, they tried, like, they just tried the most ridiculous union busting tactics. They tried to separate us, they tried to scare us, but in the end, we prevailed and we won. <laughs> what does the process of unionization look like? What is it like to organize a union, a collective bargaining unit with your coworkers? Uh, it looks like uh, trying to counteract the one-on-one -on -one sessions that Starbucks would have with uh, employees. Like they would sit someone down and like not personally attack them, but like use their specific situation to try to sway their vote. Like an employee who really needed health care, they would sit them down and be like, hey, if you vote for the union, your health care might change. So it looked like a lot of, you know, trying to convince people that, hey, if you work with us, we can get what we want. And that's really challenging when, you have, when you're going up against a corporation that is worth billions of dollars and can hire attorneys and can run a anti-union campaign day and night. I mean, you know, it's hard, it was really difficult for us to counteract all the stuff that they were doing because while we're doing this, we still had a day job, you know? I still had to like whip out a bunch of cafe mochas <laughs> while I'm trying to organize my friends. So uh, it was a lot of uh, five minute conversations while we're on break. It was a lot of text messages like, hey, do you want to meet up for lunch so we can describe what a union was like? And it was a lot of having to stare down the uh, uh, corporate greed in the eye and fight back. That's pretty much what it was. It was, it was scary a little bit because we didn't know what was going to happen. How did your coworkers respond to the campaign? What was it like collaborating with them and you know, the process of organizing itself? Can you describe that? Yeah, I can describe it. It was... Uh, I got into the store like 
maybe one week before the ballots went out. Um, like they literally hired me and like seven other people to come in and like vote no, thinking that we would. So it's hard for me to really comment on what went on beforehand, but I do know that uh, after we uh, were all hired, sorry, can you say the question again? <laughs> what did it feel like to organize? Oh, okay, what did it feel like to organize? It felt like, uh, I don't know, it was tough to be in the moment. Um, organizing is challenging uh, to begin with, but it was really difficult trying to break through uh, the lies that they were telling. I mean, that was like the hardest thing. We, we would be telling the partners one thing, but then corporate, like Starbucks would be telling them another thing. So it was really hard to fight that. And like I said, keep my day job at the same time. So, You know, it's hard for folks who aren't doing this to understand that you're risking your job. You're mm -hmm. risking your, your livelihood, maybe yeah. possibly your career. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't think I'm gonna get hired at any other uh, fast food joint after this. So. <laughs> I really hope this works out. <laughs> but we were talking backstage about uh, other potential career opportunities for you based on what you've experienced and what has inspired you. Yeah, I mean, so you wouldn't believe that I am actually supposed to start nursing school in May of this year. Um, yeah, no, love that for me. Probably won't be doing it. <laughs> I just feel like, like, this is so, like this is just like for me, you know? I just love helping people change their immediate circumstances. Um, I was telling a friend of mine the other day, like she was asking me like why I'm so involved in this and I'm kind of just like, look around. The government is not coming to help us. We're not getting universal health care. We're not getting $15 minimum wage. We're not getting police reform. Like we're not getting any of those things. You have to fight in your local communities to get the change that you want. We might not be able to get. <laughs> We might not be able to get Medicare for all or $15 minimum wage uh, federally, nationally, but we can get it at the Starbucks that I work at, and you can get it at the Starbucks in your area. You know what I mean? You can change your immediate circumstances. Stop depending on Joe Biden to come in and save you because he's not coming. <laughs> and I don't think he ever planned on coming, so. <laughs> You have some friends who showed up. You already gave them a shout out, but maybe you want to tell the audience a bit about these folks from Memphis who came here. Yeah, I mean, they're going to tell you more about their experience tomorrow, but they were fired essentially for trying to organize. And if you probably want to look over there, a lot of them were black, just like me. I mean, they, Starbucks claims that black lives matter, but they try to silence our black voices. And I just think it's just disgusting, the contradiction. So. They will tell you their story tomorrow. I don't want to put words in their mouth. How have customers responded? I mean, at the end of the day, you're, you're a service organization. You yeah. guys are making uh, you know, expensive coffee for folks in a hurry looking for that caffeine boost. Yeah. What's the community been like? Uh, well, I don't know if you know, but Buffalo's like a working class union town. Uh, the, the girls there get it. So a lot of the customers were just wonderful in the sense that they would come in and tell us like, hey, like we really am proud of you guys. We want you to unionize. We would get orders that say union strong, union proud. We still get those orders. Um, the week after our vote came in, I got like, my tips went up like three times as much. <laughs> um, so like I said, like they, they supported us with their money, which is like, you know, just as I would say the most important part. I mean, uh, so yeah, the customers have been great. When we went on strike in January, we did have some people who crossed the picket line, and I love mess, so I would just like go to these customers and be like, hey, what you doing? Like, do you not, <laughs> can you not read the room? We're not going to Starbucks right now. Um, and a lot of them would just like go into the, the back door, but you know, they didn't have the courage to go through the front door, and that's all that mattered. <laughs> Never cross the picket line. Yeah, no, never cross the picket line. Um, I will find you and I will shame you. <laughs> Speaking of which, there's a, a local Starbucks that looks like they're trying to organize as well. Yeah, it is. And you should all go support them. I think there's two in this area that have started the process. So including the uh, 24th and Newsies, right on.
Yeah, um, I think, yeah, you guys should definitely go in there and support them. Uh, the best way that you can show your support would be to go into these union stores and let the employees know that you support them. If you have time, talk to the manager. Let the managers know you support them. Um, go in and ask the employees how you can support them directly because they will know better than me. I don't know what they need down here in Austin compared to what we needed in Buffalo. I have to imagine that the environment is a little more hostile toward unions, maybe in Texas. I wouldn't know. You guys can probably tell me. Um, so if, yeah, you can go into the stores and help them. Also, I would really recommend only shopping at Union Starbucks. Uh, someone should create an app or something where we can see which stores are uh, filing. I, don't, I feel like there's some tech people here. Maybe someone can get on that. <laughs> Let's talk a bit about the vision here yeah. for the campaign. Yeah. Long term, what is Starbucks United looking to achieve? Uh, so right now our goals, we would like to have a contract ready to be voted on by May 1st, which is my birthday, by the way. Born on uh, May Day. I'm turning 26, so I'm losing the health insurance, so it's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> really could use that contract. Um, but we're looking to get, we want, higher pay, we want cost of uh, living raises, we want the ability for customers to be able to tip us via, like when they do credit card transactions, which is wild that we have to even fight for that. Um, we want sick days that we don't have to cure by working ridiculous amounts of hours. Uh, we want vacation time because, you know, even though I work at Starbucks, I still like to take a vacation once in a while. Um, we're fighting for promotions that are equitable. I mean, even at my store alone, there's not a single black person in leadership. So we're fighting for, we're fighting to make Starbucks a company that is diverse, equitable for everyone and fair. And one that pays well, because again, that's the number one thing is pay. <laughs> for me at least. I imagine for everyone else though, we all love money. <laughs> well, if um, the minimum wage had kept pace with productivity, it would be $25 an hour. Yeah. If it had kept pace with Wall Street bonuses, it would be $44 an hour. So looking at a place like Austin, mm -hmm. Austin obviously is a, you know, has this reputation as a little blue bubble in a big red state, uh, but it's not a union town. Austin uh, is, is in a right to work state. Um, there's very few uh, union uh, businesses here. Uh, I'll give a shout out to the workers at Book People. We mm -hmm. have a, a bookstore here in town. So when you go into Book People, something I do when I buy books there, I just want to say I'm shopping here because it's pro-union. That is we also have a union. another thing you can do. Let the and Starbucks know that you are here because it's a union Starbucks. The, the company won't change course until they realize that unionizing is profitable, that unionizing is hot, you yes. know, it's sexy. That, that, that's what they want. They want... They want it to be something that's good. And right now they don't see the union process as something that's positive. Yeah, but then again, you know, the reasons why we have a weekend yeah. here in this country, it's because of the trade unions. Um, you know, one of the few beers that I used to drink, PBR, Paps Blue Ribbon, ma made in a union brewery. And uh, it just something that here in Texas, we don't have, an, and I'm a New Yorker, I grew up around uh, union members. Um, the Kroger workers in Houston are negotiating a new contract, the UFCW. And unlike in Colorado, where Kroger got their asses handed to them uh, with you know, really bad publicity and they lost the campaign, um, the union in Houston is backed up against the corner. Um, they're not getting the support um, because it's a right to work state. What else can folks in the audience do to support not only the Starbucks here, but there's been a wave of worker organizing in Austin. The Draft House United, um, folks at the Alamo Draft House have an IWW logo, the Industrial Workers of the World. Um, folks walked out of Via 313 Pizza several weeks ago, which is a, a local Detroit-style pizza chain, which as a New Yorker, I find abhorrent. Uh, oh, sorry, I got really upset there. <laughs> Detroit pizza? Yeah, also Buffalo, New York has some of the best pizza. You guys are all sleeping on it. Um, I'm gonna shout out Buffalo the entire time I'm here. 716 all the way. <laughs> 716, Lake Effect. What else can folks in the audience do besides shopping at the unionized Starbucks, besides supporting that campaign to push the labor movement to 
ensure that this city, which has among the highest costs of living, the most, uh, most income disparity of any growing city in America, what else can folks do here? What else can folks do? Um, I think that folks have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. I think that when people are protesting or striking, I think even if you have nothing to do with it, get up, get out there, and join the protest. I mean, we are stronger in numbers. And while we all love to share a cute post on Facebook, let's be real here, it doesn't do anything. You need to get out on the picket line and make your voice be heard. Um, and I think you need to just sit back and listen to the leaders who are telling you, hey, this is what we need, this is what we need you to do, and this is how you can help. I'm not saying that you know online activism isn't activism. It's definitely cute, but it's not protesting. Um, it's not striking. I mean, we, we had to go on strike in January. Mind you, I'm from Buffalo. It was like 10 degrees out there. Yeah, eight feet of snow. I was out there in like, my cute little shoes and my, like, holding a picket sign in 10 degree weather, it's like cold as, cold as hell out there, I swear. Cold as hell out there. I don't wanna do this, but you know, I have to do it. And we had, we had such gr uh, great community support. We had random people just joining our uh, picket line. It was, it was nice. Um, but you gotta get comfortable with being uncomfortable. I mean, you can just go out there and join random strikes, I guess. Uh, Help people with organizing, get involved with organizing, put pressure on your ineffective, feckless leaders. Let them know that you're upset, let them know that you're mad, let them know that you won't stand for this. Don't shop at places that union bust. Uh, that's very important. <laughs> they, they only do it because it's profitable. Uh, you have to hurt them where it matters and that's their wallet. What advice do you have for folks that want to organize their workplace? Um, what advice do I have? I would say I'm just gonna use uh, what, what, the, what the biggest challenge was at my Starbucks. When they, like I said, I was part of the eight people that were hired to sway the vote. They hired, and like when we, the eight of us got together, we were just like looking around, we're like, oh shit, we're all black. And like, you know, that's completely fine and dandy, but we work at like a super white store. So it was like, how did you even find nine black people to like, <laughs> put in here. And mind you, we're like just sitting around a table, kiki in, like trying to figure out how this happened. And we come to, the, and you know, after the vote came out, it was, I believe, like nine, 19 yes, nine no votes. And I'm nosy. So, and mind you, the voting is all anonymous. So I go around the store trying to figure out like who voted no, and I realize it's like all the people of color. Uh, maybe like one other white person who voted no, but it was pretty much all the people of color. So Starbucks, tactic of hiring a bunch of black people almost succeeded. And I think that they saw that the movement at first was being spearheaded by two wonderful women at my store, Jazz and Michelle, just wanna shout out them. Um, I think they noticed that the initial movement lacked a little bit of color, lacked a little bit of flavor, and they used that to their advantage. They knew that the black people of color, I mean black, black people of color, wouldn't see themselves in the leadership so they didn't feel like that the union was for them. And that's why I believe they voted no. So my biggest advice would be to make sure that your organizing committee is diverse, is representative of the people who actually work in the area and at the store, and to make sure you're having difficult conversations with coworkers who don't look like you. I mean, like I said, people vote no when they side with a corporation. And people only side with a corporation when, you know, that's, that stuff that happen. So I think it's really important to make sure you reach out to everyone, make sure everyone's concerns are heard, and to make sure that your organizing committee is diverse. That's just super important because they will try to separate you amongst racial lines, anything that they can use. And race is really effective to separate people, unfortunately. Cortland, thank you so much for making the trip here. Let's give a round to Cortland and Starbucks United. Thank you. <laughs>
so inspired. Um, so now Errol will introduce our next panel on labor and economics. So over to you, Errol. Thank you so much for your work today. I am so stoked about this panel. Where is everybody? <laughs> I'm like all alone up here. So our two panelists are among my favorite people in the food industry who are not only doing groundbreaking work in organizing in their communities, but literally creating a new model of organizing for all food system workers. So it's my huge pleasure to introduce Magali Licoli of Ensaremos from Arkansas. Thank you. And Gerardo Reyes, Coalition of Immokalee Workers from Immokalee, Florida. Thank you guys for making this trip to frozen Austin. All right, it's usually a little Arkansas warmer here. Arkansas is not any better. Yeah. <laughs> Florida is. I'm scared, <laughs> but let's not talk about that. So starting with you, Magali, can you just give a brief introduction of the work you're doing and your organization? Yes, thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to always share about the work that we are doing in Arkansas. My name is Magali Licoli. I co-founded Venceremos, which means we will overcome with a group of uh, poultry women that work in different uh, poultry factories in Arkansas. So we pretty much are a women-led organization, Brown. Um, yes. And obviously now we have a lot of uh, poultry worker men joining uh, this effort. And both we, the, we co-founded Venceremos in 2019, just uh, some months before we had the pandemic in this country. And we built it because it's been, I mean, we are in, a, we live in Arkansas. It's a right to work state, but also it's a corporate state nominated basically by Tyson Foods and Walmart. And so the conditions on organizing are very difficult and since I began doing this work since 2014, trying to seek solutions to address the issues that were happening and have been happening for decades. And in 2019, with the help of many organizations, including the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, we founded Venceremos with the idea to ensure the dignity of poultry workers. And, and also with the idea of adopting the worker-driven social responsibility model, which is a proven strategy to improve labor conditions at corporate supply chains through legally binding agreements uh, between worker-led organizations and corporations atop the supply chain. And we're here. Awesome. Gerardo? Um, well, I mean, we come from a reality in which we have uh, pursued two main goals since the beginning of the Coalition of Immokalee Workers founded in 1993. Uh, I got involved in uh, 1999 because there was a case of modern day slavery. Uh, and through meeting these workers and, uh, you know, our own conditions brought us to meet with the coalition. Uh, the conditions that we are aiming to change and the two main goals of this campaign is uh, to improve uh, wages and working conditions for workers that have seen their uh, wages in the tomato industry stagnant uh, for more than three decades when the coalition started since 1978 and for the next 30 plus years the bucket of 32 pounds was paid 40 to 45 cents uh, with, with no change whatsoever. So. That was one of the goals, and the second was to uh, address that unbalance of power between workers and their employers that uh, you could see uh, you know, present in the lives of workers in the form of sexual harassment, sexual assault, situations of violence in the fields, crew leaders carrying guns. All of these happened before the coalition started organizing. And along with this, situations in which, while you already poor, disenfranchised, and abuse, uh, in the most extreme cases, workers would get, uh, you know, in cases of modern day slavery, forced to work at gunpoint. Uh, that was not the only case. There's been several cases that have taken place. 
Uh, that's our context. That's where we come from. Uh, the way in which we have been pushing against all of this, uh, it's through uh, the market, through like first trying to bring the growers, we knew that it was not going to uh, change the industry as a whole. But we knew that if we were to align with the buyers, to, to, to join forces in conditioning purchasing uh, to the implementation of rights that include the zero tolerance policies for modern day slavery, uh, child labor, which are in place now, and uh, sexual assault. And every other uh, violation a worker can complain right now because we have created a power, but I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that a little later. Uh, uh, basically, as workers, we didn't have uh, much uh, than a huge dream when we started fighting. You know, as a community, the focus was with the growers first, but then we realized that it was a matter of power where workers needed to have the power to be able to negotiate something that was not abusive, to negotiate and to push out of this industry all the most egregious abuses that I mentioned. So that's where we uh, started with the campaign for fair food. Uh, we started with uh, Taco Bell. Uh, there was a boycott of four years, uh, several attempts at communicating with them. Uh, the fail brought us to that point. We were one of the poorest communities in uh, the nation and we were able to then uh, bring them and since then until now there's 14 agreements. That's the power that we're talking about that is now protecting workers in the fields and that is now uh, also serving, uh, you know, to, to address issues in other industries. Magali, could you talk about the impact of COVID-19 on poultry workers, but also how it really inspired the need for this worker-driven social responsibility that both of you are creating? Yes, as I mentioned before, uh, when we built Venceremos, we were uh, fighting for the dignity of these workers because these workers were facing issues with the line speed that was already too high, was at 145 chickens per minute. Uh, workers, uh, a lot, all of these workers have respiratory problems because of the high amount of chemicals at those plants. So when the COVID hit, I remember that we were meeting in a church uh, while we were getting the resources to build Venceremos. And I remember back in March when these women workers were just, I mean, we, we, we didn't know anything about the virus. We, we only knew that we're killing people that it was already here in the country. And also we began hearing cases of uh, outbreaks in other processing plants in the north part of the US. And so the workers were just terrified because they, as, as a, the industry, they are not allowed to practice social distancing. They work shoulder to shoulder because they pretty much act as machines. They have to do a repetitive motion and they are not allowed to have enough breaks and so these conditions, these persistent conditions were alarming these workers that didn't have any leverage to even fight for their own rights. They don't, they don't even have rights to begin with. And so I remember the, these workers were so terrified because they knew that it was just a matter of time that they were facing that situation. And, and I remember that during the time when the economy shut down, everybody, most of the people were, went home to be saved, but the essential workers had to remain in their jobs. But not only that, it was they faced the lack of protections from corporations and also from the government. I remember during those months, it was March, April. By April, uh, the former president, Trump, was already protecting these companies by not allowing them to shut down because they were crucial to, to maintain um, the, 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 the people in the US. And so I remember that we didn't have any ways to, to file any claims with OSHA. OSHA was not doing anything to, to prevent the spread of COVID in the plants. 
uh, the USDA, instead of decreasing or setting a, a line speed that was uh, humane to these workers, what they did was to provide waivers to multiple companies to increase the line speed to 174 birds per minute. So we were facing the lack of protections that these workers didn't have any basic leave, that these workers were actually incentivized to come in and work while sick because they were, by March, these companies uh, were offering $500 uh, in bonuses with the conditions that workers should not miss any date of work and that these, bonu what these bonuses were going to give to these workers by July of 2020. So these companies were incentivizing workers to come in sick. Um, workers don't have basic leave. By history, they, uh, they are used to come to work while sick because if they miss work while sick, they will get a point, a disciplinary point that ultimately will mean that they will lose their jobs if they reach to 14, 13 points. So the conditions were there, and I remember these workers were just too desperate and we didn't have any ways to fight unless we used our own power. And that's what we did. We couldn't meet in person, but we had to be very strategic about how to do that. The fear was there, so we pretty much had to uh, re-strategize everything and to do everything through to calls and through Zoom. But also we had to split the workers by plants. So all the workers had to address the issues in their plan to fight back, to stand up. And so that's what we did. At a point by J June of 2020, we were organizing five different plans in the Northwest Arkansas. Workers were doing worker petitions. Uh, we were doing actions outside the plans. We were doing car caravans. And by December of 2020, historically, workers at the Georges plant went on a strike demanding protection. So that was like, that was, I think, Venceremos was uh, too, was just a space for workers to create power. And just, it's been just beautiful to see that these workers, before the pandemic, where they were too terrified to stand up, but they were more terrified to, to lose their lives and to, to get their families sick than losing their jobs. So we had just to take this on as an opportunity to create workers' power and to, and to move forward with that. Um. Gerardo, I'd like you to talk a little bit about how we need to push corporations to change their buying habits in terms of leveraging the power of the purchase order and how this type of organizing, this worker-driven social responsibility is about changing the purchasing patterns of big corporations. Exactly. Um, well, for us, uh, this is an issue, you know, of workers needing to have the power to be able to negotiate what is fair. You cannot negotiate what you don't have the power to negotiate. So that's where everyone in this room and everyone in the country uh, comes at, a, at the center in terms of importance to stand in with workers to be able to push corporations to come to the table and sign on to legally binding agreements, which is what we've done. Since 2000, uh, we started to talk, analyze, uh, once we did the last action focusing on the agricultural industry, we realized the buyers are bigger, more powerful, they have a lot of influence in terms of what they demand, and they always demand the best quality, the best uh, size, uh, even the state of maturity. Like, there's so many factors, but never the human factor. Never before, I should say, until we came into the pictures uh, in, in this regard. Uh, so there's been 14 agreements since 2005. Uh, that was the first one with Taco Bell and its parent company, Young Brands. And then McDonald's, Burger King, Subway, Whole Foods, Bon Appetit, Automark, Sotex. So even Walmart is participating on this. And this is something that was created by workers themselves. I haven't said that, but I come from that background. I am a farm worker since I was 11 years old, mixing school with working in the fields, 
harvesting watermelons for protein seasons, harvesting tomatoes, a little bit of everything, you know? And we have never seen anything like what we were able to build together because of the power of people across the country, people of conscience of understanding that this is not a matter of supporting workers that are suffering in a forgotten corner, if that's the case, because that is the case very often, and that was certainly ours. It is not about feeling sorry or sad for the fact that there are cases, and here I'm gonna mention the case in Georgia where there were 71,000 workers that were forced to work on the threats of death for them and for their families because the bosses, the families that had them under those conditions uh, and their associates, it was a network that basically in the span of a few years was able to exploit about 71,000 workers. Charging them with 45,000 pesos, that's what I heard directly from the workers when we were uh, helping a little bit on, on all of these investigations with different cases that help us then uh, bring all of these and ask for a resolution that then uh, was, was uh, brought in November. Now, these workers uh, reported that uh, they were forced to work, that they ha suffered a uh, heat stroke uh, like three times, younger workers. There was a worker that died out in the fields. Many of them were forced to dig up onions with their bare hands. Uh, and there, were, uh, there was a case of, uh, you know, workers in this situation being raped constantly. That's part of the indictment. That's the nastiness of it all. And I, when I turn and see the news about avocados and how in a fraction of a second, as soon as a threat is made to an inspector in the U.S. because of avocados, uh, uh, you know, relating to, to just the threat, I wish as a society we could respond in the same way when it comes to farm workers that have dedicated their lives. And for, from society, I, I will ask, Please don't feel sorry for us. Stand with us. That is what we need. We have 14 agreements. And Wendy's is next. 2nd of April, we will be marching in West Palm Beach. If you get excited about this idea of standing with us, just get in touch with me before we leave. <laughs> be happy to talk. Magli, we, we're going to need to close it out. So how can folks support the work you're doing in Arkansas, in, uh, in the shadow of, of big chicken, of uh, <laughs> the big chicken monopoly. Right, well, we have a big dream to adopt the worker-driven social responsibility into the poultry industry, because um, there is a lot of need to change that industry. And as a right-to-work state, uh, the unions are not the solution to us, and after the workers travel to Imokali and so, firsthand the power of this program and how this program is changing lives for better. Uh, the, worker, the workers in Arkansas decided that that was the strategy that we wanted to take upon and we want their, your support. We want uh, to stand with us in this fight because it's gonna be big, it's gonna be huge, but also it's gonna be very rewarding not only for the people supporting but for the workers. Right now the workers are suffering even more is not just on the COVID, but workers are completely injured working your chicken that you have every day at your table. Uh, these workers uh, need protections and they need our, your support. And so you're welcome to support Venceremos, to follow us, um, to stand with us, and let's continue fighting. Gerardo, is there, are there any companies locally that maybe folks should stop by those restaurants and ask why they're not signed on to the Fair Food Program and Coalition of Immokalee Workers programs? There are many companies that are. I got excited. Uh, I got too focused and too comfortable, sorry. Uh, uh, no, there are, there are uh, you know, in the case of uh, the boycott of Wendy's, we're asking people not to uh, support this business until Wendy's realizes that this is not a, a matter that, that is going to be solved with PR. 
you know? What they do is try to escape using language that doesn't really solve anything but confuses people. What we have has prevented modern day slavery, sexual assault, and is preventing also child labor. Those are mandatory things. And then every other abuse that happens has a resolution. We need Wendy's to come to the table. And we're asking people to also visit our website, print a letter, go and talk to the managers of these restaurants. That's how we have convinced 14 other corporations with a, a couple of exceptions that didn't need it, like a lot of pressure. But most of them, you know, they need to hear from all of us because it's that power that makes the difference in the way in which they see us. So the 2nd of April is gonna be a march that we're gonna do uh, in Palm Beach here locally. I mean, there's other companies like Kroger, for example, like uh, other uh, supermarkets, other uh, chain uh, food, uh, different like retail food uh, industries. There's 80% in essence that is not participating in helping us implement the Fair Food Program. 80%. That means most workers in the country are suffering the conditions that I mentioned. And the reason why that case happened, it's because there's nothing like the Fair Food Program being implemented. That's what happened outside of it. And we want to expand this. And that's where we're going. So thank you very much. Folks, Gerardo Reyes and Magali Nicoli. What an amazing panel. I want to thank all the panelists and Errol for doing double duty today as a moderator. Um, our next uh, conversation will focus on land, history, and culture. And I'd like to invite my panelists to the stage. Adrian, do you want to come? Or Alex, come up first. Go ahead. Go to the far end. Thank you. Give them a round of applause. They deserve it. Okay. So I'm so excited to have you all here. And you all came from different places with different perspectives, and I think that's really important. Um, and I just want to introduce you all very quick, quickly. We have Adrian Lipscomb from uh, 40 Acres and a Mule. <laughs> My dear friend, Ade Romero Briones from the First Nations Development In Institute. And Alex Rosales from the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Okay, <laughs> Valley. I, I want to thank them again so much for being here. It really means a lot to me. I think it's an understatement to say that we, we need to talk more about the intersection of land, history, and culture, and the racism that is so deeply entrenched in our food and agriculture systems here in the United States and all over the world. And that leads me to my first question, which I'm going to pose to all the, the panelists. As I said before, one of the things that I appreciate about being here at this university in Austin is the opportunity to have really uncomfortable conversations, conversations that make us all sort of squirm in our seats. We need to be doing more of that every day, questioning and, and having conversations that, that really um, change how we think. Um, and, and conversations that particularly, to be honest, make a lot of white folks uncomfortable. I think that's important. So when I, I want to ask my first question, you know, the, the U.S. government stole land from BIPOC folks, literally stole it. And I want to ask each of you, what's been the impact of that, that land grab, that stealing of culture and food ways and, and, and the way people interacted with one another in their communities? And Adrian, you look like you want to go. Um, oh, I'm, I'm going to actually jump yeah. in on this one real quick because I do think the framing of the question is really important. And when we say stolen land from BIPOC folks, it's important to remember that BIPOC, um, like I don't know who BIPOC is. I'm not a BIPOC, are you a BIPOC? I don't, we're, mm. we're, there's like the black experience, there's the indigenous experience, there's Hispanic experience, and these are all the experiences that are worth storytelling, that are worth expressing, and when we kind of lump them all together, it kind of minimizes the impacts that this history has on these communities. Yeah, it pretty much has. And yeah. so we need to recognize that there's experiences that need to be told in their fullness by the people who've experienced them. Go ahead, Adrian. 
Thank you so much so, for doing that. So she literally said what I was going to say, but I was going to top that with not just stolen lands, but stolen bodies. Yep. So, yep. you know, before we can even talk about the land itself, it's the stolen bodies and being brought across or the stolen bodies that were tilling their own land that are now tilling their land, you know? So I think we have to go a little bit further than that. And definitely my ancestry experience is completely different than everybody in this room and on this stage. And I think we need to address that and not dilute it by bringing us all together because those stories, um, those stories got us to where we are today and, and where we are having this conversation and to lump it all as one thing, mm -hmm. our experiences, it, it feels like it is diluted and the importance is gone from that. I appreciate that. Yeah, and if I can add, you know, we were just talking backstage and, and it's not something that happened in the past. It's continuing to sure. happen now. I mean, you know, we were talking about how I can't even move back to my own hometown where I was born and raised because I've been outpriced. Yeah. And it's happening around Austin and it's still happening today. So, I mean, that, that, that those are things that by having discussions now about the past, we can learn and perhaps come up with ways to think about those conversations for the future. Absolutely, and this question of real estate came up before and I'm glad we're continuing it. Can you dig a little deeper onto that? Like how you've been priced out, how so many people have been priced out because of, of the gentrification and other things that are happening in these communities? Uh, well, I'm gonna defer to my city planner right here. <laughs> she, she, she knows. I'm gonna put my city planner hat on Please. right now, take the chef hat off and put the city planner hat <laughs> back on. Um, so I, a lot of you are, if you are from Austin or you probably have heard um, about Austin and the positivity of how the housing price and everybody's moving to Austin, but nobody's really talking about the bad end about the gentrification. Gentrification just didn't start here in Austin. It didn't start last year, five years ago, 10 years ago. We're literally talking about gentrification when they decided to move um, black, Mexican, whoever who was not white in 1932 and they moved them to the east side. They moved their civics first, so it was all policy, right? So we moved, we moved by policy, so we moved their churches, we moved their commercials, and we moved their dentists. I mean, we were pretty integrated back in the day, but this was a point where they pushed us all to the east. And then over time, when we, we had freedmen towns that were available, that you, Wheatsville, those places that you know those names of, those were freedmen towns and freedmen areas that were integrated, and they were mainly black. So as economy grew, as businesses grew and tech grew and we started to develop downtowns, you saw areas of people of color being pushed out to the brim. So think about it, 20 years later, what happened? Does anybody know what happened 20 years later after 1932 or so? The highway. So then you had the physical separation coming in, so I-35 coming in, and then that massive build out for mm. I-35. And then where was land cheap? East side. So then you started seeing the need of more transportation, so you had rail come through, and it goes through the east side. Then you start realizing where do people want to be? Where is the excitement? It's downtown, and then that's where you start seeing, um, if you saw the crescent, I used to call them a crescent, where the minorities were being pushed out, and they were creating a crescent on the outside of of the area. Let me tell you, so I'm back in Austin. I don't know if you know. So hey, South by, I'm back <laughs> in Austin. I just moved back home. Um, and one of the first calls, or a friend asked me, they said, are you moving to Lockhart? And I said, why? <laughs> I've been gone for five years, you know, but I, I, I know, trust me, my family's from Caldwell County, Maxwell County, like barbecue, hey. But I'm still like, why? And they said, everybody's moving there. Mm. And I was like, what do you mean? Well, yeah, let's, I mean, I wanna talk more about this policy in a day, like indigenous peoples have been impacted by American policies here in the United States that are similar but different to, to what Adrian's been talking about. Can you talk a little bit more, more about that so that I can truly separate you and not lump you together, which was my sincere mistake? Oh, no, no, I think, well, in terms of BIPOC, I think people are getting so used to using it that sometimes we have to pause and say, okay, where does this come from? And to me, it really means like everybody that's not white. And I don't think that's how we wanna have these conversations. Mm. And so we always just have to think about our terminologies. But that I, I, Adrian's story is perfect because when you take it even further back, like at some point, our land was commodified. At some point, we all agreed as a society or some people agreed for us that land was worth something and land could be held by certain 
people that met a certain profile and anyone who tried to get land outside of that profile couldn't. And so you see this accumulation of wealth from a s the point of colonization and settlement that just um, has, ki has kept accruing and accruing right. and accruing. And at some point, and hopefully it's today, I mean, it's, it's been happening probably since the early 1900s where we have to stop and say, hey, this isn't, this isn't what we want as a society and as a people. Sometimes parts of a society have to stop and listen mm -hmm. to all the conversation that has been happening since that time. Um, and at some point we have to amass enough of the society, our majority, to say like, okay, we're really gonna have this conversation. Because there's so many voices who have said the same thing over and over sure. and over again. It's time to listen. Yeah, and we do, do we need a reckoning? Do we need to really come to terms with this? Do we need policy? I mean, Alex, I turn to you now because you work with young people. How do you approach this idea with your students? How do we, how do we talk about the idea of a reckoning and, 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 and come up with policies that will now turn around this tide of what has happened to so many indigenous cultures, so many black cultures, so many Hispanic cultures, I think Asian Pacific Islanders. H how can we turn this around? You, you know, I mean, this was said earlier. I think w with young people in particular, the lowest hanging fruit is to try and change your immediate community and try to influence your immediate community. So, you know, for those who don't know, I work in the Rio Grande Valley um, in deep south Texas. It's where Sue, Sue Beckwith mentioned. Uh, we grow most of the food uh, for the state of Texas. Actually, we grow the most fruits and vegetables in, in the whole state. Um, and so, and yet we have all the you know, food-related diseases, right. um, food insecurities. Uh, th there's lack of, the, we have the worst food access in almost an entire country and the highest rates of diabetes and obesity. And so, you know, here we are in, in what, what we is the breadbasket of the state, and yet we feel powerless, yeah. right? I mean, and young people feel that. I mean, we, we all, everyone in this room feels that. And so um, for me, it, it, you know, being where I am, it's, it's easiest to try and give an example of how we can do this in our own communities. First, maybe in your own household. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, as a student, as a young person with a lot of energy, maybe, you know, healthy legs and back, you know, maybe planting your own gardens or working in our, in our uh, university, at our university farm. And you know, trying to really uh, I influence um, our outcomes mm -hmm. at that level, which mm -hmm. is the easiest level in which to influence those outcomes. So when we have students right here who have gone to city planning meetings with us and, and, and spoke up in, in, in favor of urban ag, and lo and behold, the, the city where our university is is now changing some of those policies. And that's a small win that gives students motivation, sure. that gives students kind of a sense of belonging because they know that they can take their skills, their passion, their learning, and apply it and yeah. have actual tangible outcomes. That's great, that's great. Adrian, I wanna turn back to you. When I spoke with Tony earlier today, we talked about the importance of, of history and understanding the history of these things. Can you explain the significance for folks in the audience who don't know about 40 acres and a mule and what that means? Yeah, I, will, I wish, I, I hope all of you know what 40 acres mean. Um, I mean, even UT calls themselves 40 acres too, so that's like really significant in, in when you think about it. But um, we're talking about, we're talking about civil war, we're talking about um, along with land grab and movement and war and a lot of deaths that were occurring. And General Sherman um, was accruing land along the way, but he was not allowed to take prisoner of slaves. He was supposed to just free them. But one issue that was happening is that the slaves were following, so the freedmen were following them and because they didn't know where to go because the South, the South and the Southerns were moving with them. And there was a question of what to do with 5,000 people following you, right? And you're land grabbing. And, um, Along with this, General Sherman met with about 21, 21 black leaders, and at that time they were more pastors, people of religion, um, that were freedmen. And the 12th question that he asked is, what do you want? Mm -hmm. And one person stood up, one man stood up and he said, we want land. And that was really significant because land provides identity, community, 
and economy, and that's pretty much what it came down to. And um, on those plots, he decided to give each one 40 acres and the mule, there were real mules over time that were part of the war um, that were given back. And so in giving that 40 acres, it was to till the land and to take care of it. But as people know, and if you really check out the timeline, um, Abraham Lincoln died during, during this. And, um, and then Johnson stepped in, who was a southerner, and was told to give the land, he told to give the land back to the original owners. And that led a whole crop of more, more war, yeah. more killings that were happening, arrests. Um, and that's when you started seeing what's called sharecropping pop up. And where you could stay on the land, but you wouldn't own it. And what you made and provide, you needed to give back to the owner. And you a percentage back to the owner, which that's where we started seeing this yeah. economy and sharecropping happening. Thank you so much for explaining uh, can that. Can I just add yeah, to that really quick, just of course. a couple points. Again, we see this like example of somebody, not us, making determinations about who is eligible to own land mm -hmm. or who is worthy of owning mm -hmm. land. But, but just layer the fact that 40 acres and a mule came after the Homestead Act of 1862, yeah. which is the time when they took all the native land and said, okay, everything that native people are on, we're going to give access to other white men, but then when it came to 40 acres and more, there was there was some land that was ineligible. Right. And guess which right. land was ineligible, which was the land owned by northern white male landholders. I think so we need to do a storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jay, I want to come back to you because, you know, we, we're still in this pandemic, right? And the inequitable land access for black, indigenous, you know, every sort of uh, a person who's been underserved in society has, has led to a lot of health-related outcomes that, you know, could have been predicted if we were, you know, smart. Um, can you talk about how the, the First Nations Development Institute, the, the, the communities that you work with, how they have fared during the pandemic? Because some have really... Mm -hmm been amazing in, in, in terms of uh, creating their own resilience. Yes, and this goes back to what Adrian and I, and we were all talking about in the back that, you know, these issues have been in existence for a long time. That we've, we've seen them, we've talked about, we have people, we stand on their shoulders because we're just carrying the torch and the pandemic was no different because we have supply chain issues that have always been there. Yeah, right. We live in communities that are not even on supply chains. We have supply chains that extort money from certain communities. These all existed before the pandemic. Yep. And then when the pandemic happened, those problems started to seep into other communities and then people started to right. pay attention. So in our communities, in tribal communities, where we've been screaming food sovereignty, we need to control our own food systems, our own production, our own land bases, our own water, our own education systems, our own political systems. Um, that came to a head in the pandemic because on the outside, the response to the pandemic for Native people was like, let's ship chicken from Arkansas to all the places that need food knowing that those chickens came, we just heard from our previous panel, from places that are exploiting their workers. So it's like these inequalities were just being shifted in the pandemic and it was the community response that said, no, we're not, you're gonna give, pay $20,000 to ship chicken from Arkansas to Arizona. Why don't you just give us that $20,000 right. and right. let us figure out how to feed yeah. ourselves. Yeah. I think this point is so D important. Can Danny, I just say? You know, let me just go ahead. let me just because this is interesting, and and Adai mentioned this. This is all of this is about power, right? And I think at some point, some people in the middle during the pandemic were like, "Oh no, we feel powerless." All of a sudden, mm -hmm. they felt mm -hmm. powerless during mm -hmm. winter storm yep. of mm -hmm. last year. People right. felt powerless, and then they started to speak up. But this is a sentiment that people have had for a long time. Farmers in particular. And it's funny because this 40 acres, now that you're mentioning it, a lot of land in Texas is still organized by, on this 40, acres. by 40 acres, mm -hmm. right? So I have growers who are like, I have a 40 acre block over there. I have uh, another 40 acre block over there. That's 120 over there. It's always in, the, in, in 40 acres. And, and, you know, they're still working it in that way. And, and you know, but those farmers, they've told me this 
before the pandemic, they said, Alex, I got to grow what people tell me to grow, and I got to buy the seeds that they sell me, and I got to use the machines that I buy from them with the chemis chemicals that come at a package deal, and I have to sell it to them at the price that they, they right. decide. Right. That like feeling of powerless, I think, is, is what farmers feel everywhere. Yep. Right? And people who maybe not even control their land because they're sharecropping, or they actually have to pay a, a rent, and they have to make that rent. So those issues that, that people have been feeling for quite a right. while, now during the pandemic, everybody's feeling. Or yeah. now during the winter storm, everybody's feeling. Right. So hopefully this momentum of this kind of sentiment of vulnerability will add to this conversation of what Adai is advocating for is, is more of a sovereignty, where we have more Absolutely. power to make our own decisions. Absolutely, such a great point. Thank you so much. With the, the minute and thir you know, roughly 30 seconds we have left, I, you know, we have a USDA, a United States Department of Agriculture, that says it's committed now with this new administration, or not new anymore, I guess, to equality and diversity. We have our first black deputy secretary woman of, of agriculture. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm wondering from all of you, do you think that they can make progress in, in creating more equality? They, they've had a lot of time to do it, and they haven't done it. You would ask that question, <laughs> wouldn't you? <laughs> Um, I'm waiting for that step forward, right? Yeah. Because um, if there's a cause, there's a reaction. And right now, we have to react to a lot of causes, a lot of deaths, a lot of inequality issues that have happened, and it can be overwhelming. But I'm waiting for someone to be brave enough to just say it. You know, USDA, and especially on the local level, there was a lot of inequality, there was a lot of racism, there was a lot of violence. And I'm waiting for somebody above all of them, and I'm not calling out the White House, but I'm not gonna call out the House and stuff, but we need to say that it was, and it is, and it's still occurring. How and what are we going to do? Because that's your responsibility. Yeah. That money's trickling down to those local levels, and it's not being equally dispersed. Absolutely, absolutely. I want to give Alex and Aday a chance to respond. Alex, please go first. Okay, um, so you know I'm on that panel, right? So I'm not speaking on behalf of the panel, officially. I can tell you there's a lot of us on that panel who are weary and we are tired, right? Because it's the same thing mm -hmm. over and mm -hmm. over again, right? In the 1920s, in the 1960s, and now again, right? And, and, you know, but it is a window. There is a window there, there's an opening, and I think we need to push through. But the people on the panel, like myself, we can only make recommendations, sure. right? I mean, we can't, uh, it really needs kind of a, a large communal effort. Everybody in this room needs to start advocating. Right. So wherever you're from, call your, call your elected official, call your municipal officials, start there. I don't know, you got, you, you know, this is, we're gonna need help. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Absolutely, we all need to be advocating for that, for sure. We're all watching. We're all watching. Yes, we are. We're moving in the right direction. We see like more diverse people. The next step is having more diverse thought mm. in that whole capitalist sector government relationship. And so all you students out there, I hope I, we're waiting for you and we have <laughs> so much work you have to do. So. Amazing way to end. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>
you had just published Stuffed and Starved, and you were working on, um, you were doing a lot of work on the way that these price increases reverberate through the global south um, in this kind of industrial, industrialized sort of global food system we have. And, um, and I think there's always a bit of a shock doctrine moment when this happens, because the idea is, oh, if we can just increase yields and grow more food and use more pesticides and use more fertilizers and flood the market, then the price will, will come down and everything will be fine. And of course, the price does come down, but we still have incredibly high rates of global poverty and hunger, and the ecological degradation just continues apace. Um, and so we, we had our boom, and then we went through our bust, and now suddenly, because of this war, we're right back into a period of super high prices. Um, Russia and Ukraine combined um, are responsible for almost 30% of global wheat exports. Um, they are thrown into chaos. Um, uh, we're, we're seeing wheat prices at, I'm pretty sure, historic highs beyond what happened in 2012-ish era, era. And I wonder what sort of thoughts you're having as someone who's thought about a lot about this topic, about, about this moment and what it means for the food justice movement to be back in this um, kind of high commodity situation. Well, I mean, it's made worse as you've written uh, about in Mother Jones, about uh, by climate change. Um, and I mean, it's just, it, it's not surprising that essentially on the day of, you know, the first day of the war, the American Energy Institute is uh, essentially reprising drill, baby, drill. I think it was the day before the war started, and, actually. Yeah, yeah, no, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, and exactly, as, as, as you've, uh, you've observed, you know, the, no crisis uh, goes to waste for the energy industry. Um, and the problem with that, of course, is that the energy industry creates climate change. Uh, and I, I mean, I remember the story in 2010. It, 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 bear with me, it's gonna take a second just to run through the, this huge arc. Um, <laughs> but I mean, in 2010, uh, we had these uh, commodity price spikes. Uh, and at the same time, we had a catastrophic fire uh, uh, burning through the wheat fields of Russia. Uh, and it was made much more catastrophic because in 2008, the response to the, uh, the financial crisis was austerity. You'll remember uh, th th those, those good old days when the, the government decided not to print a ton of money uh, and instead just cut back services. And this was a global doctrine, uh, and the Russians did it. Uh, and so they cut back their firefighting service. And, so, uh, and also, in order to raise money for the treasury, uh, they sold uh, access to large parts of uh, forest areas that were then deforested. And so when these fires start, First of all, there's lots, lots more kindling and lots more to burn on the ground because the forests have uh, you know, essentially been denuded, uh, and there are no firefighters. And so what is already a sort of once in 500 year weather event that causes a drought that then causes a catastrophic fire is made worse because climate change isn't just weather. It's also the interaction of weather with social systems, and in this case, capitalism. Uh, so uh, the fire burns in Russia. And what does the commodity industry do? Well, th th there's a meeting in Zurich uh, with uh, a company called Glencore, one of the world's largest grain traders. The, the, the representative from Glencore goes to the Russian embassy and says, hey, Russians, if you stop exporting grain, you'll be able to feed everyone because you know, right now there's a global you know, price, there's a price spike for you in Russia. If you stop exporting grain, that's, that's more grain for you. Uh, don't you worry your pretty heads about what, what's happening in the rest of the world. At least people in Russia will get fed. Two days later, Russia institutes a grain export ban. Uh, the global price of grain goes up, and all of a sudden, you start seeing food riots. And you see food riots in Mozambique. Uh, and this is odd, because wheat doesn't grow anywhere near Mozambique. Why does Mozambique have a food price riot for grain? It's because of colonialism. It's because uh, the Portuguese come to Mozambique, install Portuguese and Portuguese tastes, and make it normal to want bread on your plate every day, and that a day without bread is now no longer normal. And this is a colonial crop, and it becomes inculcated in society to render it normal. Uh, and so all of a sudden, you have bread riots in a, in a country that doesn't grow its own bread, that depends on Russian imp uh, wheat imports, but the price has gone up. Uh, and then, because there was austerity, the government hadn't been buying uh, enough rubber bullets, and so they used live ammunition, uh, and uh, 11 people were killed in a bread riot. So. 
that arc, right, it, this is about colonialism, it's about capitalism, uh, it's about climate change, it's about the weather, it's about grain, it's about oil, and here we are again, uh, 12 years later, and that tragedy is being repeated as a deeper tragedy, because again, it's a global problem, uh, and one in which we can fully see what's going to happen, and yet it will happen anyway. Uh, I mean, and that's the definition of tragedy. You can see every bad decision uh, foretold, and yet, like Cassandra, here we are, um, screaming into the wind. Yeah, and, um, and so the response in 2000, in that, that period, I mean, this period of high prices lasted, there were spikes in it, roughly 2008 to 2013. Um, how did governments respond to it, and how did social movements respond to it? How has the deck been reshuffled um, since then as we, you know, I mean, I, I feel like I woke up one morning and saw the price of corn go from something like $4 a bushel where, where it's been for a long time to $7.50, and the last time it hit that, hit that point, there were tortilla riots in Mexico because People, a lot of people in Mexico get a lot of their calories from corn, and suddenly they can get priced out of their staple. Um, so how has the deck been reshuffled? How do, you, how do you see it going this time? And you know, what are the opportunities for social movements to you know, counteract the shock doctrine of we have to drill more, we have to spray more pesticides, we have to use more fertilizer, even though the price of fertilizer has spiked um, beyond imagination as well, because R Russia and Ukraine are also very involved in the natural gas business, which is tied to nitrogen fertilizer. Um, where do you see the opportunities here? Honestly, I, th I think things are worse this time around because uh, the, the soft left, um, you know, I mean, in other parts of the world, the Obama administration would be on the right, but here they're <laughs> on the left. Uh, and th that administration shat on social movements so comprehensively. Uh, it, it ignored the demands that were being, uh, you know, th th that came from grassroots movements for, for transformative justice. And so you had uh, essentially a reimposition of neoliberalism from, the, you know, fr from the center left. Uh, and that means that there's a whole swath of the population uh, that feels entirely correctly betrayed. Uh, and in that moment, you've got the, the openings uh, and the, the rise of the, the possibility of the far right. And so, whereas in the last crisis there was a moment for, you know, for, for social movements mobilizing and governments, you know, and going through the, the, the work of building grassroots movements and petitioning government and governments turning around and, and essentially selling out uh, you know, the, the working class, it's not surprising that now the working class sees its future in uh, authoritarianism. Uh, and you know, look at India, for example. We had this fantastic farmers' movement, right? That, that it, it was able to reverse Modi's three laws uh, and was able to, to send Modi packing. Uh, and yet, who just won the uh, the election in the most populous state? But Narendra Modi. Uh, and that that shows that there that there is a, a success that the right has had, both in corroding the institutions of democracy themselves, uh, but also in claiming the space for transformation that uh, should give us all pause because you know, in the midterms, the, the bloodbath is, again, easy to see, but the, the greater worry is in the, the next election and the, the, the politics that emerge after that, no matter who wins, uh, are gonna be fairly dark in this country and concomitantly around the world. I, I mean, what do you see? Um, I, I feel like this moment has come upon us so fast. Like, I don't think that many people I mean, I know that there was a lot of talk about this invasion happening, but I think that the way that it went was, uh, was such a shock that it was A, so aggressive, and B, that the resistance was so great that we are spiraling. I mean, all, all I can say is that I, had, I was in New York, in Brooklyn, and watched the towers tumble in 2001, and when I saw that, I. I said to myself, I don't know what the fuck is going on right now, but what I do know is that everything is different now. We are in a new phase that's chaotic. I used to cover finance. I used to cover uh, you know, sort of Wall Street finance, and I, w was, I remember where I was, I think it was 2007. I, I was farming and writing about food politics. I wasn't in that world anymore, but I'm you know, watching the news as this financial crisis plays out, and when Lehman Brothers 
vanished from the face of the earth. Again, this was incomprehensible, it was impossible, and yet it happened, and I thought to my, it took a couple of years for, it to ha for the crisis to fully play out, but everything's different now, we're in a different era, um, and I think that we're in, a, we're in such a moment right now um, where global geopolitics are shifting, um, shock doctrine, the sort of Naomi Klein concept of you know, people in power using crisis to reinforce the status quo. It, it's happening at, um, at a speed that is breakneck, like literally before the war started. The, um, this announcement comes out, and I, you, know, you can already feel agribusiness, global agribusiness, uh, realizing that it's got a moment here, um, and that its idea of, hey, if commodity, you know, the scarcity mentality, if commodity prices are really high, then the thing to do is produce more food. And you know, I wrote a book about how the two most important farming regions in the United States um, and in the world, most productive, are the San Joaquin Valley of California and the, the Midwestern Corn Belt. And both of these places are in a fairly advanced stage of uh, ecological unraveling. And this moment brings the companies that control these, uh, these areas that dominate the workers, that mistreat the workers, that um, are spoiling the e ecologies of those places, um, it gives them the chance to say, hey, we need more of the same. And I, I think, I, I don't know where it's going, I don't know what the answer is, but I think the big challenge is figuring out ways to counteract that and to um, refocus on creating economies of solidarity and, and of justice um, and to sort of, you know, take the, the opportunity as aggressively as the people in power are. Um, the, you know, there's some differences, like they have literally trillions of dollars in assets that they're defending, and that throws off billions of dollars in funds to push their agenda. But I think that, you know, I, I'm not saying that I have the answer, but, you know, people coming together and fighting in coalition and with solidarity as, um, as a, a sort of main principle, um, building out opportunities. Because, I mean, you know, the same, um, I believe it was the day the war started or the day after the war started, the IPCC came out with that report talking about this the, the UN's climate um, um, council came out with this report saying just how far things have unraveled and just how, how um, you know, short the window is uh, to move things in a new direction. Meanwhile, the world's exploding um, around us. So, I mean, th th we've got about three and a half minutes left. Uh, and <laughs> I, but I, and I, I want to ask you the question I always get asked. So are you hopeful then? Um, I, you know what, the only, this is, the only thing that I can say, that the thing that sort of, the, the quote that haunts me is, um, is Kafka scribbling in his notebooks. Um, you know, K Kafka, you know, writing um, not long before the Holocaust, um, writing, in, I believe, in the 1920s in the Austro-Hungarian world of, um, of Prague. His sister ended up perishing in the, in the you know, dying in the Holocaust. And, uh, and he, he scribbles in his notebooks, there's hope, but not for us. In other words, that, um, that there isn't a lot of hope in the short term, but I think there is hope if um, the work that I was just talking about happens, that there can be a better future. But I've, I, I don't feel like in my adult lifetime I've seen more kind of threats out there. How about you? Um, I mean, given the amazing people who've been on this stage today, yes. it, it would, it, we're remind, I, I mean, I'm, I'm reminded that, that hope is something you do. Uh, and it is the, the result that you, it's something you earn. It's something that, you, that it, it doesn't come free. Uh, it, it's not the sort of thing you wear on a T-shirt and ask uh, former President Obama to, to put on Netflix for you. Uh, it, it's the sort of thing that, that you, you, you have to fight for. Uh, and there have been so many fighters on this stage today um, that it's important to remember that, that you know, it, to, to say there is no hope is to betray, uh, is, is to, is, is to betray that, that work. Uh, and I'm not going to do that, and, and you know, neither. I mean, it's, it's like crossing a picket line to say, well, you know, you, you, can, you can try go unionizing or uh, you know, fighting for fair food, but 
uh, you know, ultimately we're all going to burn. Uh, that, 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 I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not there, not yet. Yeah, uh, and if you... And, uh, but, 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 I mean, I, I do, I mean, you know, that this idea of sort of pessimism of the intellect uh, and optimism of the will is important. But it's also important to remember this is difficult work, particularly in the Global South. And I, I, I do want, before we close, just to remind us to, that, that internationalism has always been part of this idea of solidarity. Sometimes, particularly in the United States, we forget that. Um, and you know, particularly when you look at the media representations of uh, the Ukraine, sorry, of Ukraine, you, you always see, uh, you know, th 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 there is a sort of racialized representation of, well, okay, these are the civilized people who are, who are fighting each other now. Um, and uh, I, I do want us to remember that there are people all the time who put their bodies on the line so that we can have hope. And I, I want to just name one who was killed two days ago, a comrade of, uh, in the, the South African Shack Dwellers movement, who was killed while he was irrigating, laying irrigation pipe in a in an urban farm in Ekahana. Um, and uh, so, uh, I mean, the, uh, Ayande Ngila is his name, uh, and he's part of the South African Shack Dwellers movement. Uh, and he was killed by ANC thugs, uh, who, uh, you know, the, the, the government has become uh, f fairly pernicious there and is fighting against social movements. But, it's, but the social movement fights on, uh, and that cooperative and that community uh, is a beacon for the kinds of world that, that I would like to see. Uh, and as are some of the, you know, the, the movements we've seen on stage here today, and so I'm, I'm grateful for them, uh, I'm grateful for his sacrifice, uh, and it, the only way to honor it is to keep fighting. Yeah, and along those lines, when I start to feel a little overwhelmed by world events, one of the, the things that I can think about that gives me comfort is the work of someone who, of a coalition that was here on the stage today, and that's Her Geraldo Reyes of Coalition of Immokalee Workers, because like no one, I mean, we're in this, we look out in this situation, all this bleak stuff happening, there's war, there's shock doctrines happening just disgustingly before our eyes, but farm workers in, in South Florida or middle Florida picking tomatoes, they face that thing, this, this sort of thing in a very concrete way uh, on a daily basis, and the patience with which the CIW has just kept moving along one battle at a time um, is incredibly inspiring. And I, rem I've, you know, over the years, vicious attacks from Burger King or Walmart or these various powers that be, and I just sit back going, you'll be signing on, the, on that dotted line before too long, and they always do because this is an incredibly patient, um, they don't have that sort of activist and patient where I, you know, I went to the picket line and it didn't change, so I, I, I'm, not, I'm not going back again. Um, and I also want to shout out someone else who has just appeared that has given me a, a lot of inspiration. That's Mag Magali Lechili of, of Venceremos. And the, you know, there is another group that faces catastrophe on a daily basis, uh, people working on poultry lines, uh, incredibly brutal conditions there, and just har you know, harnessing worker power in a right-to-work right state and sticking it to this giant corporation, once again with great patience. Um, both of these groups continue doing their work, continue needing support, and that is the kind of thing that, that does give me hope. Just sort of watching them, reporting on them, um, is, is something that, you know, for all the horrible stuff that I write about, um, having groups like that out there doing work just, it's what keeps me going. And I think we're, um, we're past our time. Our, our 15 minutes of fame is, or in, our 15 minutes of infamy is, uh, is spent. You went over time, Tom. But thank you for ending on, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for ending on a hopeful note. Um, and I want to uh, reiterate something Raj Patel said. Hope is something you do. And people are putting their bodies on the line every day for a better food system all around the world. So thank you both very much. <laughs> I want to thank all of our speakers. A huge thanks to Dr. Karen Maggot and Dr. Colette Pierce Burnett and the whole Houston Tillotson community for welcoming Food Tank and all of these amazing sink, uh, speakers and thinkers. I also want to thank Oatly, Little Hers, and of course South by Southwest. I will hope you will all join us tomorrow in person or virtually for the Future of Food Day One and the Conference on Food, Resilience, Access, and Equity. It's free and open to the public. Please arrive at 8 a.m. for breakfast tacos from Vital Farms. Uh, we'll run until about 7 p.m. 
So we can see you there on Food Tank's YouTube page, and we'll be back here at Houston Tillerson on the 14th and 15th for really cool uh, watch parties of important food films, including The Man in the Field, Gather, where you'll hear a day Romero Briones talk again, The Ants and the Grasshopper, you'll hear Raj Patel talk again, and The Last Harvest. Please register at foodtank.com. And finally, let's give a huge round of applause to all of the production team and my co-founder, Bernie Pollock, who made this all happen. Thank you all for being here. Be safe, and I'll see you soon.